This is a more than just podcast production. Welcome to this podcast, season four, episode two. Uh, my name is Tim Mitchell. I'm in Toronto, Ontario. I'm joined once again by Jonathan Kulan in Mississauga, Ontario. Hello there. And we have Jaime Lopez Jr. in Seattle, Washington. How's it going? And we have two special guests today. South of the Mason-Dixon line, we have Tammy Coron. Hey there. And we also have Bill Coron. Hey. All righty. Okay, so, um, yeah, we're completely messed up today. So I'm just going to... I, I know I had some fact check here, but I, I don't know what happened to it. Anyway, so um, let's just jump into the headlines. Another we? perfect episode. <sighs> All right, into our headlines. This was a big week for Star Trek. We got some good Star Trek news to talk about. We uh, we had uh, we had first contact day, which was uh, just an interesting excuse for Paramount to trot out a bunch of trailers for their new material. So we got a trailer for Picard season two, a little teaser trailer. We got a teaser trailer for Discovery season four. We got another one for Lower Deck season two, and we even got a look, a little sneak peek at uh, the animated version of Catherine. Janeway from Star Trek Prodigy. So now we should have let Tammy weigh in on all of those, but you know. Oh, I am in my head weighing in on every single one of those, by so the way. Why don't you weigh in on Picard season two? I can do that, but I didn't finish season one because I was one of those people who started it as soon as it came out. And then I got to as many episodes as were available. And then I there were no more to watch because I had to wait and be patient. And then like a thousand other things happened and I never got back to it. So the last episode, spoiler alert, the last episode I saw was where Picard got blown up. So you never saw Riker and Nine make out? No. And oh, I feel man. badly because here's Jonathan is saying that there's a season two and I'm like, oh shoot, I never finished season one. And same thing with Lower Decks. Like I did the same thing. Like I started watching it and I I loved it. Like I thought that's, that's that animated one. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh, this is really great. I'm going to love it. And then I got into it and then like a thousand things happened and I never got back to it. And now you were like, Oh, and there's a Janeway animated thing. I'm like, what? Janeway's like my favorite. And I didn't even know about that one, but <laughs> yeah, I, I thought can Picard tell was you. your favorite. I'm confused. Well, Picard is my favorite original captain. Janeway is my favorite lady captain because like if, okay, if I put, if I put P Picard, and Janeway in a room. Wait, okay, so if it's if it's the Gorn episode where they're both <laughs> on a planet and they have to kill each other, who's going to win? Janeway. And I'll tell you why. Because because Picard, he's a gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> I say he Whoops. throws Earl Grey tea in her face and Earl Grey tea, hot! Right? But no, so like, so there's all this stuff and, and the only recent Star Trek that I'm up to date on and, and Bill, my husband, who I sort of drug into this, uh, into this special podcast here, the only thing that, that recent Star Treks that we finished was Discovery. And that's most partly because my, my mother, who also is a Star Trek fan, she's like, oh my gosh, the new Discovery's out. Have you is seen it? Is your mother it? available like, to be on the show tonight by any chance? <laughs> I should just drag her in. Why not? Make it a family affair. But I have to tell you, like, so the next generation used to be my favorite of the Star Treks. And then Discovery came and I'm like, oh yeah, that's now my new favorite. So I don't know. See, I'm just off topic already. You can't trust yeah. Yep. me why'd you even have me on this show I don't know. tim i don't know i don't know what are you thinking uh, well i'm, I'm kind of curious so picard blowing up i'm like isn't that like episode one or two maybe three if <laughs> for the first it's season three. it's not very far but, okay but i'm telling you i was so into it i was like oh my gosh there's a new picard and i had to watch it right away and they didn't have all of the episodes streaming and that's like that's okay so that's See, how okay, diehard so, so i this am is, we talk about this on the show all the time is the fact the difference between when they dump all the shows on netflix and let you binge them or they they deal them one show or two shows at a time it's just stupid they should people do like that. tammy can't do that yeah no because that's dumb <laughs> i don't mean to throw tammy under the bus i mean but there are certain people in the demographic who who want their cake and eat it too they want to be able to watch they, they don't want to sit and wait for or or like tammy they're busy but it's, i think it's a good discussion we, and we've had it over and over again the idea of you know we'll, we'll later in this episode we'll get in we'll have a little discussion about you know falcon and the winter soldier 
or some of the other things that are going on right now. But I think it's nice when you can actually have time to digest the episodes. You know, when they drop Stranger Things or some of those shows where they drop all the episodes at once, the conversation's over in a week. And then you end up in these strange, awkward conversations, which we're currently in, where people aren't <laughs> caught up. Right. Like that's that happens all the time. You know, oh, have you watched Stranger Things? Like, no, I didn't have like 14 hours to sit and watch that in two days. Like it's a tricky situation. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I, I like to I like to be in control of when and how often I watch something. So one of the things that that my husband and I do somewhat recently, since we have so many people living with us now in our house, you know, thanks to current events, is we don't really have a lot of time where we can just sit down in a quiet room, just the two of us and just hang out and do whatever it is we want to do. And what we've recently decided and have been able to do is pick a show you know, whatever, if it's on HBO Max or on Netflix or on Hulu or wherever it is, and just sit down and pick that show and maybe watch one episode or, you know, if we have a little bit more time in the morning, two episodes, you know, depending on how long each episode is, and then watch it that day. And then the next day, you know, because we get up at like four in the morning, five in the morning, whatever it is, we watch it together. And then we go off and we do whatever it is we're going to do during the day. And then more people wake up in our house and you can't even watch anything anymore. But it's really nice to be able to say, okay, you know, we've got three seasons of this show we want to watch or maybe something from the 90s where you got like 10 seasons or whatever. And we're able to every day get up as a couple and watch it and enjoy it. And that's sort of what we did with Discovery. You know, it, it came back for season three and we were just able to enjoy it while everybody else in the house was asleep and just kind of hang out and watch an episode every day for you know whatever like a month or or two weeks or three weeks or whatever the timing turned out to be versus okay the this new episode drops on a wednesday and and we we don't have cable so we gotta wait till it streams so we can't watch it till thursday or friday or whatever thing we're waiting for it to stream on becomes available and and then we got to do that next week and god forbid you know something's happening on that day and we can't watch it's just it's a real hassle so i'm thankful for when uh things like netflix just drops their entire season and sure i'm a little sad at the end of 10 or 12 episodes that we've binged watched in you know 14 days or whatever (laughs) see that's how i do math (laughs) and it's like you know okay so we pick something new so i don't know like I, i can see the point where maybe you can't have a conversation with other people who don't have that luxury of binge watching but at the same time i don't even want to talk to those people no i'm kidding those people are fine <laughs> how, how do you get around the internet when you're dealing with that though i mean I, I find it really challenging to to not be spoiled on stuff see i don't do social media anymore so i'm hardly uh, spoiled there you go yeah yeah That's and, secret. Yep. and even when i did like when i was big big time watching the walking dead and i was usually again i was always behind because we haven't had cable in, gosh, for so many years, I don't even know. So we would, you know, I don't remember when The Walking Dead would drop, but they let's just say randomly, they would, Sunday. they would, on a Sunday, and then we wouldn't get the episode until like a Monday or Tuesday, and I made sure that I just stayed away from any Walking Dead conversations online, because I didn't want to be spoiled. Mm. Yeah, you I think know? they're on season 37 of The Walking Dead right now, aren't they? At least, at least. Yeah. So, hey, so, we just started rewatching The Walking Dead okay. yesterday. Hang that, okay, I feel sorry for you. Um, <laughs> I have a question. Uh, well, what do you know about the Janeway? We've talked about Janeway, the the new animated series, which is called Prodigy, by the way. What do you have? You heard anything about it? So, in this particular uh, video that Jonathan's got here, they they talked to Kate Mulgrew about her role and how she decided to have it done and whatever, right? So she's going to be the. She's actually not going to be a character per se. Well, she's kind of a a, a spoof of herself. She's going to be the emergency training hologram, a la the emergency hologram from Discovery. So she's going to pop in and tell the crew, "Hey, everybody, how's this? Yeah, watch out for that prime." directive so yeah she's she's basically playing an, a sort of hyper version of herself controlled by the computer but still with a cup of coffee in her hand which i thought was hilarious so and of course you haven't watched lower deck so you don't know but you don't know the twist in lower decks that boimer is going to go and fly around with Riker for half a season until Riker throws him off the ship right half a season i bet you doesn't last an episode 
<laughs> well, they got to get the gang back together, right? Absolutely. The, the, the gist? Yeah, for sure. All righty. Is this all the Star Trek uh, news we have to talk about? Today? It is. I guess uh, just I'm curious about you and, and Jaime as well, what you guys thought of, uh, well, Discovery and... And, and the big the big reveal in the teaser for Picard. So one. we should totally spoil Picard for for Tammy. Well, because I mean, well, really, at this point, I mean, it's, the it's teaser... not a huge thing because it's a teaser, and we don't know any more than than she would just by saying well, the teaser. So the teaser is at the 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 teaser trailer is about thirty seconds long, but it focuses on the letter Q. Q. Oh. Oh, guys, you you can't really spoil Tammy. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I every morning we sit down, we got you know our ritual. We watch what we're watching, but you know, I know that she's been on every chat room and every. She knows things that they haven't filmed yet. Right, right. Okay, that's true. I spoil it for myself. Well, so <laughs> throughout throughout the whole lower decks thing and throughout the whole Picard thing, we all as our show, we called Q being on on one of these shows at some point in the future because he had to show up at some point, right? They can't just have such a great character, especially played by John Delancey. They couldn't just let that one lie, right? Yep. Yep. That's it. Yep. I mean, it's it's too delicious, especially <laughs> because you have the de-aging technology now that, like, I I know nothing, but I believe they'll have uh, John Delancey show up and he'll be the way he looked in the, in the 90s and then say, okay, Picard, I'm gonna, you know, you look so old, I'll look old like you just to make you more comfortable. And then they stop having to use the budget on that trick right and they can just have him be normal uh however old he is john delancey and they can sort of work it in with the character and what he's able to do right so i i, I predict that this is what's going to happen yeah that's actually mm-hmm. a really good call i think i was wondering how they were going to have him be aged up but having him empathetically being aged to mock picard actually would be a great way to play it yeah, yeah. One of one of my uh, favorite episodes is is uh, the one I guess the transporter accident and Picard and Roe and Guinan come back as as kids, children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and the kid who plays Picard is really good because you know especially when he has the temper tantrum, right? Yeah. I'm like that's totally like Pat, you know, like Pat, Patrick Stewart doing a temper tantrum, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's cool. All right, let's move on. All right, uh, another one. We got some more trailers this week. We got a new trailer for the Black Widow movie that is coming to Disney Plus and to theaters in I don't know where, but certainly not here. And also for uh, a more robust trailer for Loki that seemed to get a little more into what we might expect the show. Did you guys have a chance to, to check these ones out? I, I think I saw the Black Widow one, but I don't think I saw the Loki one. Yeah, I've, I've, I mean, I've seen them. Uh, they, they've got me pretty hyped. Uh, Loki, I'm, I'm ready for. I think it comes out roughly after... Um, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier ends. I don't recall if there's a gap. I think it's after that. Bad Batch. I think it comes out after Bad Batch. Okay, because I wasn't sure it timing everything out because I couldn't remember the number of episodes for the Falcon and Winter Soldier. And it's couldn't remember. Six. It's only six. Okay, well, that yeah. was the okay, that's that was the gap then. All right, gotcha. Yeah, but one of them is an hour long disco clip. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, Loki's I'm not kidding. starting till June 11th, so I think they're straight from Falcon and the Winter Soldier to Star Wars Bad Batch, the animated series and then from that ending into loki oh, what's bad batch bad batch is a spin on the clone wars cartoon oh, it's an animated okay. series and it's tied into some of the events of the last season of of clone wars mm-hmm. by the way speaking of like, sidebar here i just uh, i was poking around on the disney channel remote the other day and i stumbled across um i don't know how i did this but i stumbled across um the ewoks cartoon but i can't find the droids which i find really weird they didn't post the droids i mentioned in our last episode they were going to put a bunch of what they call the vintage series up, right? Yeah, that's what I saw. Yeah, yeah. So they put up a bunch of classic cartoon stuff from the Star Wars universe. But they didn't put up droids. I don't know why not that, but they put up all the episodes of Ewoks. Although they didn't restore them or anything, they look horrible. I will say. I actually sat down <laughs> and tried to watch a little bit, and they are really rough. Um, I have right. some of the original animation cells here. I'll I'll donate them if they'll actually use them to fix this because <laughs> it's awful. Right. Uh, but yeah, they put up that. They put up the original cartoon there was holiday special in 1977 the uh the boba fett premiere is up there now the uh tartowski clone wars the the actual not non-digital animated 
series is up there. And the two live action Ewoks cartoon, uh, not non cartoon live action series are up there as well. The Caravan of Courage and uh, Battle for Endor are both up there too. So they, they dropped all that last week and we, we took a bit of a turn through my side and, and um, the only thing that held our attention was that Tartowski um, Clone Wars series, which is still great. Cool. All right. So I'll have to dig into that. Yeah. The Loki trailer, I will say, just to, to wrap that up, the Loki trailer is, is a good one to check out. If you're not really sure what to expect from it, it definitely adds a lot more than the previous teasers do. It looks very timey-wimey, and they sort of explain that, you know, in, in making the move in, uh, spoiler alerts, three, two, one from Endgame, when Loki takes the Tesseract and he vanishes, this, is, I guess, picks up that storyline as to what he what happens when he disrupts the timeline by picking up the Tesseract and leaving. Okay, so it was two years ago that Endgame came out. Are we, do we still need a spoiler alert? It's that? also, like, the second biggest movie of all time, so, you know. Oh, okay. But I'm going to put it out there anyways, in case. Does the Titanic actually sink? I can't remember. Yeah, really. Uh, and the Blue <laughs> Cats win in the end. The, the trailer looks really good. Like, I think this has the potential to be the most interesting of all the series. Like, it looks sort of puzzly, like WandaVision, but kind of epic, like Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I think this could be really good. So is it a movie? The Loki thing? No, it's a, yeah. it's a, a Disney Plus series, just like series, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Oh. I think it's six episodes, and it's okay. it's meant to be sort of this grand time-traveling, oh, multi-dimensional yeah. deal. So it looks good. Right, right. Oh, you know what? Mm. I have a confession mm-hmm. to make. You haven't seen Endgame. Yeah. So, no, I, <laughs> I actually have. Um, my confession is my son's girlfriend was just talking about the Loki trailer. Uh, I guess it was just yesterday. And she says, oh, Loki's got a uh, origin story coming out. And the way I heard it was because we were talking about something different at the time. And then I guess the trailer came up. But the way I heard it was low key. He has an origin story coming up. And I thought she was talking about some other person who on the download <laughs> yeah. has an origin story no, that, coming that out. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to admit that, but it's right. true. Okay. It's going to be a low key story. Mm, right. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of gifts. Uh, yeah. So we we talked last episode about the uh, the unfortunate passing of Jessica Walter, a uh, famous actress, of course, best known probably for Arrested Development, but loved by many of us as the voice of Mallory Archer, the uh, matriarch on the uh, Archer animated series. So we sort of said, you know, geez, I wonder what this is going to mean for the final or for the next season of Archer, given that she's such a huge role in it. And uh, they did announce this week that she did actually record her lines for the 12th season of Archer. Now, the question is, will this now be the last season? Are they going to find a way to uh, pay tribute to her to send her off? I think that's still to be determined, but I'm excited that, uh, you know, she at least had a chance to finish that piece of work, which is a, a great gift to leave behind to us because she was so, so very talented at that show. So I'm excited that that's coming. Uh, next up. Oh, geez, Rick. We got a new season of Rick and Morty coming. Yay! Finally. Um, as, as you know, this show finally, Wait, yeah. what? finally. Yeah. season five, isn't it? Season five. Gosh, I really need to dig out from <laughs> under my rock. <laughs> the 20th of June is Rick and Morty day. And Woo-hoo. we're going to get, uh, the fifth season starting. So this one's been really, uh, you know, again, uh, Rick, Rick and Morty is a great gift, but it, I can do it in two parts again. Well, they show like three episodes and then go away for six months. Oh, my, mind you, it is a pandemic. I shouldn't complain. Right. Yeah. They haven't said how they're going to do it you're right last season they did uh, i think five episodes and five episodes this one they haven't said how they're going to do the the rollout hopefully they've had lots lots of time to do stuff it's a weird circumstance with that show because it's so frigging good but it takes so long so you you kind of have to sort of hurry up and wait on that show but it is so good so i'm I'm really excited we're gonna get a chance to get back into that one because never never a bad episode of that show what's everybody's favorite rick mine's pickle rick (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah, but what my, the question though, Bill, is which Morty are we watching in this show? Mm-hmm. Right, yeah, mm-hmm. right. <laughs> I just I just rewatched one of the ones from the season where he's got the 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 remote where he can go back in time and replay. Like he can go back five minutes and you know pl- replay and go back. Five, and at the end, spoilers for people who haven't seen it, Rick tells him that every single time he replicates, he's <laughs> replicate. He has to kill the other. He's going into a different parallel <laughs> oh, universe, <I> <laughs> and they have to kill. 
off Morty. But Morty's been he's been through time dimensions a couple of times. We we're not really sure which Morty we're actually watching on through any of the seasons, right, John? Yeah, it's a, it it really is a show that goes a lot of different places and really takes you on on a bit of a head trip because there's a lot of things. I mean, they aren't even in their own dimension anymore because the original right. versions of themselves are dead. They moved to a different dimension. So yeah, it's it's pretty convoluted, but it's a lot of fun. So much so much science nerdy fun. I think Jaime's up now. Yeah, you were asking about Bad Batch, and if you didn't know what it is, we have the trailer here for the Bad Batch. Guess what? So that'll that'll help. It's it's basically the the sort of weirdo oddballs from the clones, where you know their clones from the Clone Wars are largely all interchangeable, minus a few hero ones. These are the hero ones that are kind of you know the the Bad Batch, as they say. So it seems like an entertaining one. This was one from the big Disney Marvel day that we talked about. I don't know some months. Are these ago. Are the guys this that the couldn't one. graduate back in the show? Or- it's kind of like they're the, the the bad news bears kind of equivalent, right? Of like they're they're more sort of individual. They're not quite as uh, like they've got their own sort of um, uh, personality traits. So uh, this is where right. remember this one. There's one episode where there was a really old guy, like a like a clone who was really old, and um, and they were all teasing him and whatever. And the, but there was like these four guys that couldn't graduate, and they were they were in clone school or whatever, or stormtrooper school or whatever they do, right? You guys know what I'm talking about? Yep. Yeah, there was. Mm-hmm. A, there's been a few episodes. I did, actually, the show's underrated for the, I think some of the best episodes of Clone Wars are the ones where they focus on the actual clones and some of the storylines where they, they really sort of get into that. Yeah, there's been a few different uh, groups of those. But yeah, this sort of spins out of uh, a group that sort of rises to prominence in the last season. And uh, okay. they're, as, as Jaime said, they're really much more distinctive personalities. They're a lot less sort of automaton and a lot more well-defined as their own characters, which is interesting. Okay, cool. uh, next up, uh, we got bad news. American Gods, the series that uh, had been on Stars in the United States and uh, is available Amazon here. Amazon Prime here. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, has been axed. So they they did their third season and and then got the axe. Now the uh, show creator slash runner, Neil Gaiman himself, uh, feels like there's still an opportunity for a season four or a wrap-up movie or some way to sort of finish what they started. Uh, apparently the production's been a bit of a mess all the way through i know the first season had just this huge litany of great uh, cast members and then a lot of them didn't return for some of the subsequent seasons so it's been a bit of a an awkward thing i don't know if you guys have had a chance to watch it i only watched the like, very beginning and i didn't continue with it because i, I yeah, just had other things yeah i went like three or four episodes in and then just sort of something else shiny came on yeah so it's it's kind of a weird one where i, I thought, always thought you know, i'll get back to it and then when i saw that it was canceled i was like oh maybe i don't have to so uh, i don't know if you guys are gonna miss that one or not yeah, I don't know what it is. You know, you know the Irish dude, the black-haired guy. Um, I forget his name. He's this one of the main characters in that, right? Um, I, I, I don't know. Mate. I just have trouble watching his show. Ian McShane. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How can you be watching his shows? Deadwood is one of the greatest shows ever put to television. I, I've, again, like put that in the pile with Buffy. I've oh, not seen Deadwood. Duh. Never seen it. Deadwood is awesome, and we cannot be friends until you watch it. <laughs> <laughs> that show is mag. It was just such a heartbreaker for it to stop. Yeah, it, it's a magnificent See, he, show. Even Bill watched Deadwood. <laughs> yeah, well, I could drop an F bomb, but I won't. All right. <laughs> yeah, it's Let me that show it. is spectacular. If only just for the incredible. Incredible use of vulgarity. It is spectacular in its use of vulgarity. All it right. is All right. fucking good. Oh, don't don't oh, say I'm that. Sorry. I'm, was, waiting. I'm oh. sorry. I was being all dead woody. You can bleep me. I'll give you a beep. Oh, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and she's telling me, oh, don't swear. On I know. <laughs> Okay. All right. Next up, uh, Thunder, 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 Cats. Ho! It's time for a Thundercats movie. Who's ready? Woo-hoo. No, Not podcast me. over. Really? Thundercats? Come on. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Tammy. Let's go have another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> this this is uh, this is my jam because I was a, a young child in the 80s when this show had its heyday. So I'm, I'm 100% nice. for this. Is that lion Was it lion and Tig- was it girl Tigra? Tigra, yeah. Chitara oh was the girl, yeah. Um, yeah, it, uh, it, so not only is it coming, but uh, this is hot on the heels. So this is by Adam Wingard, the director 
director of Godzilla vs. Kong, which just came out. Uh, he's had a nice little run with this and done some other good work. And so he's decided his next project is going to be to to kick off and do a Thundercats live action movie. Is Judy Dench going to be in it? I mean, if she's not, we're all missing out. Is also, it going to be better than Godzilla vs. Uh, uh, King Kong? Because <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> did you watch that? I did. Okay. And I regret wow. it. <laughs> I was really looking forward to it, but I still regret it. All right. Harsh. Harsh. True, true. I think I can hear Jaime's teeth grinding together. That can't, can't be good. Oh, man. It was good, but there was no story. Like, the, the fighting was good. Who wants a story? All I want to see is King Kong and Godzilla beat the crap out of each other. Uh, popcorn. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Odd man out. I see. <laughs> Tammy hasn't been around to hear me defend uh, both Pacific Rim movies as sometimes <laughs> I just want to turn off the brain, eat popcorn, and watch kaiju punch each other in the face and i got exactly that out of godzilla versus king kong so the customer satisfaction rating is very high on that one because oh, nice. i wasn't expecting you know some shakespearean play i was like the humans are there as an inconvenient means to get to the next monster punching scene yeah nice. i have to admit i watched skull island the other day and that, that's pretty much what that whole movie is is him versus those weird sort of lizards right yeah but skull island had a story sort of true not yeah. a good one but it did have one <laughs> <laughs> Picky Oon. <laughs> All right, my last thing uh, for our headlines, two DC movies got quietly scrapped this week. We got news that DC's pulled the plug on Ava DuVernay's New Gods movie and the perhaps wildly ill-advised Trench movie that was sort of a spinoff from the Aquaman. It was supposed to be about this this sort of weird part of the ocean where these monsters live and the weird people that live In there. The Trench? The Trench, yeah. It's it's the, the from the Aquaman they did. Okay. Oh, always seemed like a bit of a weird thing to spin out. I didn't think there was a huge appetite to get into that, so I'm not really surprised about that one. I'm a little surprised about the Ava DuVernay one. One, she's got a lot of juice. She's very, very talented and um, it's it's interesting to see why they're doing that. The, the word is that they're canceling that one because it just didn't fit in with where they want to take the DC films going forward. New Gods, uh, for those who aren't familiar, 1970s Kirby. It's very sort of big and epic it is tied into what we just saw in the justice league movie it's the whole dark side universe you know apocalypse it's, a, it's sort of the good versus evil set in this sort of little pocket universe that they inhabit and it's a bit fantastical i can see why people aren't sold on this being you know an instant hit so i can see why they went, might want to pull the plug on it from that perspective but it is kind of weird to have gone down the road this far. They announced that quite a while back, like at least a, at least a year ago. So they've been working on it, and clearly they just it wasn't coming together the way they wanted. Well, there's no secret that DC has trouble making movies, right? Yeah, or, or, or getting box office or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I guess they just they didn't think it was a safe enough play, so they just decided to, to can it. Well, Tammy, have you seen The Mandalorian by any chance? Bits and pieces. <laughs> Okay, you've seen enough to, to, to get where I'm going with this. Um, so we have a trailer here for Ghostbusters Afterlife, a, a sequel to the original uh, Ghostbusters. Wait, uh, wait, hang on. How does that even connect to the Mandalorian? Wait, I, I feel like I just stepped in. Okay, I'll wait. Well, we'll I'll will. be patient. <laughs> we will. Patience. Patience. Um, yeah, because that's totally in my vocabulary. <laughs> So we have this short, um, you know, uh, clip here from the new Ghostbusters Afterlife movie that's coming out with Paul Rudd at the store as getting, you know, groceries and snacks. And we see the 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 mini puffs, which are uh, small miniature versions of the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man, the iconic ghost from uh, the original Ghostbusters. And boy, if it doesn't feel like uh, the Baby Yoda effect. And I'm 100% for this. Like, I want a mini puffed here on my desk somewhere. <laughs> and I really want them to really these uh marshmallows branded uh in the store so i can have some okay jaime you know Bad. i absolutely adore you but that is such a stretch going from a mini stay puff to a to a mandalorian like you'd have been better off no, the baby yoda in the mandalorian. baby yoda you'd have been better off comparing it to a mini me from uh i don't even remember what movie that was from austin powers yes thank you from the 90s but how do you it's I the can't. cutesy factor it's the cutesy <laughs> factor for I sure 
and I don't even know where to go from here. <laughs> Let me tell well, you. I can tell, I can tell you where we go from here. <laughs> is it something shiny, you. Tim? Is it? Is it, it shiny? It is something shiny. <laughs> it is totally shiny. It, and it and it is a little movie that came out in 2002. No, no, a little TV show in 2002. TV show came out in 2002 that they completely screwed up and, and showed in the wrong order, uh, which is weird because, you know, um, IMDb has them listed by, or, by air date, right? So I was trying to do some research for the show and and because it so the story is this right this is this is joss whedon's you know sci-fi you know great sci-fi show um with with the firefly class ship and malcolm reynolds and all that kind of stuff and and the backstory for those of you who don't know tammy and myself and the podcast we've done before is that in 2016 i brought tammy a copy of firefly for her to watch and it has taken her this long we're now in 2021 for her to sit down and watch them and and um and a pandemic a global pandemic is and a global that. pandemic yeah they had, they had to had to hold her down to watch it anyway, i needed a little but, encouragement <laughs> she did yes thank you bill thanks thanks bill for that hey tim tim that that made our our morning rendezvous classic yeah for sure for sure um yeah because i think you tried to watch it back in back in the early days and, and just couldn't get into it but um and it, we planned on having this amazing you know idea that we would watch it or tammy would watch it one show at a time and we would get on spotcast and talk about it because the three of us i mean myself and john Jonathan are fans of Firefly for a long time. Um, many of our friends that, that both Tammy and I know are fans of Firefly, and Tammy was the sort of outlier, right? Anyway, um, more like an outcast. Yeah. Come on. So, so I reached out to Tammy. She agreed to come on the show, and then you know, I, 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 I sat down and watched episode one. I said, "Okay, I've watched episode one. L- l- are you ready to record um, a special spotcast so we can start doing this Firefly review?" Right? And she says, "Dude, I'm on episode seven." <laughs> <laughs> it was that good. It was that. Good. Sorry, can, we can you say that slower, please? It, oh, oh man, I'm gonna make me eat my hat. It was that good. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. So anyway, so uh, here we are. We're gonna talk about Firefly, and then we're gonna move into Serenity, which is the movie that came out of Firefly. And I was saying before we started recording, before you showed up, John, that I was surprised when I went back and looked at the dates because I think we were talking. That's what my fact check was. We were looking. I was looking for the dates. So it it basically the date dates on IMDb are 2002 to 2003 because that's when they aired right um, they aired over you know over the over the Christmas break right but um, before it was canceled after they showed what 11 shows I think they didn't show the pilot first of all which is a two-hour episode um, and they didn't show and they didn't sh- and they didn't show the last three episodes I believe right yeah. Um, but they did show. Yeah, they started uh, with the train job, which, without context, mean makes no sense. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Because um, it's—I mean—it's sort of a western genre kind of movie in a sense, but but it's sci-fi, which is why it's strange. If you haven't seen Firefly, I'm trying to explain to what what it is. But anyway, um, yeah. So I mean, let's 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 dig in here on on this show. So uh, I'll start where where I sat down and watched it again. I hadn't I haven't watched the actual TV show since I first saw it because it's. Not not really on you have to either have the box set or um and it's just it, in fact i had to pay i had to buy a copy off of itunes to watch it again for this show i have some bad uh, news for you it's now on disney plus thanks to the star edition that they made like two weeks ago perfect oh Good. really <laughs> because okay because i remember it so i have also not seen this in nearly two decades so i've only seen the uh, original episodes when they came out in the air um uh, tim threw me in as like fan of firefly but i'm like very very loosely associated so i'm gonna have probably the least to contribute in this section um, wait and- a second no i have to stop now i mean you haven't seen the entire series apparently yes. not if if some parts of it didn't air because uh, i actually do i run own the box set i've just never mm. cracked it open because it came out in that <laughs> oh my I, I acquired gosh. the box set in that in that awkward time period where it was like oh i can get this cheap oh but i'm also sort of switching everything to streaming and it here in the u.s was on netflix for a very long time that's all right i thought it was on hulu and did not realize that it is apparently now on disney plus so i actually could have watched it so back this. what was that about star you mentioned john yeah um, 
I'm not. I'll, I'll I'll clarify that for you, Jaime. It's on that new piece that they've added to Star International Disney Plus. So Star Disney TV. Plus in South yeah. America here in Canada, you can get this new piece they've added on called Star, which is essentially Hulu. Another subscription. It, it's essential. Well, it's free. It comes as part of your subscription fee, but it is basically a lot of the Hulu and Fox material that they already had, but brought to the audiences here because we don't have a Hulu. So I would imagine where it actually lives in America is on Hulu and you have to have a subscription to watch it. But I don't know that for sure. I know here now they just put up like 200 TV shows and like 500 movies in the last couple of weeks by adding this star feature as part of Disney Plus subscriptions, including all of the Fox stuff. I think it is from Hulu because I think that's where Bill and I watched it was off of our Hulu subscription. Sadly, Tim, I didn't crack open your box set. I just didn't have. Oh, I know. Heart. Keep it mint in box. Right? You know, keep it I mint mean, in box. You know. <laughs> Well, that'll be worth money yeah. someday. Right? That's what I'm thinking. It was at least 50 media dollars at Kmart where I bought it. Yeah, Do exactly. you not have a VHS copy you could have given them, Tim? Just to, you know, really go retro? Yeah, no, 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 no. I actually bought it at the Kmart in Tennessee on the way to see Tammy when I first, when, the, only, the only time I've been to her. Some place, people bring right? flowers, some bring food, bottle of wine. No. Yeah, but he did bring whiskey set. with it, so I mean. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, yeah, he brought Canadian whiskey. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. From That was from, from Canada, actually, but yeah. yeah. And maple syrup, I think. Right, you did. Yeah. All right. So, what were the what were the highlights of the season for you, uh, Jaime and and Bill? We want to know what what really jumped out at you. How did how quickly were you in? Was it you know episode one? Did you take a few to get into the characters? Where like where did they have you? I guess I'll go first because mine will be the the shortest and saddest. Um, so it, I actually like the very first episode that they showed on Fox because that one I, I don't remember the actual main plot. What really stuck with me is a scene that that uh, made me realize that this is going to be different. So they've they've beaten the the villain. They're kind of hanging out in front of the the ship with the villain, and the villain's like, "Oh, I'll, I'll get you, gadget, next time," sort of thing. And Mal just you know kicks him into the engine and the guy turns into chunky salsa right like i (laughs) i I love that i was like oh man like i just am used to the tv trope of like oh okay i'll get you gadget next time that'll be a recurring villain is like no they they do not mess around on this and it was it was hilarious after you know being shocked so that 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 one stuck out to me sort of immediately and although i'm i'm privy to the fact that that uh, this is a a a great shame that that fox messed around and showed that episode first and not the actual pilot um not saying it was a good decision i'm like oh you know in in 2002 me was was entertained tammy bill what do you what 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 jumped out at you right off the hop where were you where was your buy-in well uh for now i i I was it was explained to me that they were like out of sequence so the first one I saw uh, was where uh, they were at war. That's, that's the that's the pilot, the initial, yeah. Yeah, the initial rebellion. And that, I don't know, I guess maybe they aggregated it in proper order. Yeah, they did. And for the, for the DVDs, they did, yeah. And for, for, I think, Hulu, they actually put it in the intended order. I mean, I'm... Uh, <laughs> I'm surprised it's not an ongoing series, really. We were too. Yeah, we were, <laughs> and still are, for that matter. Although we'll get into the, some of the reasons for that in a in a bit. Well, having having spent almost a, a decade at Apple, uh, you know, for icebreakers, I mean, low hanging fruit is, hey, what are you streaming lately? And there was always somebody streaming Firefly, mm-hmm. always mm-hmm. somebody discovering it. I think it's kind of like almost like a. Uh, a continually building cult following. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. I mean, there were people who became fans watching it on TV initially, right? even even though it was shown in the wrong order. And then there was um, then there was people like me who saw it, and Jonathan mentioned earlier before we started talking that Rick McGinnis had given him the box set as well. And uh, hey, Rick. But um, he doesn't listen to the show, does he? <laughs> I don't think we're his uh, area of, of enjoyment, no. but I'll let him know. <laughs> All right. Um, but uh, so I, I watched the box. I, I had the box. And then that was early in the day, you know, I think, I don't think we really, we were really into Netflix and all that kind of stuff at that point in time. So we I, you know, I was watching things like Breaking Dead and, and Sopranos and stuff like that. So I was into watching these shows that were, were at that point in time, they, they'd already been past their original dates. Right. Um, and yeah. And it was just uh, it, the, the order that they came out in, they showed the first episode, which is called the pilot's called Serenity. Right. And that's a two hour long episode. And, and just a, a, on the side, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but so yeah, I mean, we watched it and then it was like oh my god like you, you get to episode 14 and you're 
you're like, where's the rest, right? That's the gut feeling you have, right? Um, and for I, and, and I was saying before that the movie came out in 2005, which is only three years later, but I don't, I seem to remember thinking it was much longer than that. Um, Jonathan, what do you think? Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember the gap because, you know, it really grabbed me when I got that, the box set. And, you know, I sort of said, oh my God, this is great. You have to watch this. You watched it. And we sort of became, you know, early adopters on that front. And, you know, I think both of us were, you know, privy to that conversation and a lot of people had, which was, God, it's so good. Why isn't there more? And then there was this sort of groundswell as particularly because it happened to coincide almost perfectly with the real sort of move into social media too in the early 2000s where things were starting to catch up and people were starting to share and talk and, and share their passions and their enjoyments online. And it became pretty clear that there was a, exactly what you guys mentioned. It was a, not only was there a cult following, but it was a growing following in spite of the yeah. fact that it was short lived and that it was aired out of order and all these things were working against it, but they put out this set and it became this sort of, you know, it was like a, a Henry Miller novel in the 1950s. People were passing it around. People were sharing it. People were starting to share files at that point. Right. And we had a whole ship full of underdogs that we loved. Well, that's, and it, it just hit all the right buttons, I think, for a lot of sci-fi fans. You know, it just it was a, a beautiful mix of a timely topic, good characters, the right cast with great chemistry. Like it just it just came together and it just snowballed from there. So there was this sort of groundswell of bring back Firefly. And then that morphed into, well, let's make it into a movie. And, and then we got our sort of second chapter. And then even then, it was not a success in the theater theater either like in spite of the fact like it, it really was just the people at the time who were sort of cult fans who went to go see it you know tim and i saw it on opening night which uh you know it was not a full theater it was pa- i thought it was packed. No, it was it was reasonably full but it wasn't like jam-packed and i think in the end it only made like 30 million bucks like it was not a lot of money that it made it barely made it back its money well it is it's a bit like uh, galaxy quest in that sense a lot of people didn't get it at first and then it took a while to sink in but i just want to go so i want to go back to the first episode because i've i've watched i don't know if you watched it again before we started doing this this particular episode jonathan but i just went through it again with as a, as a seasoned fan you know knowing all the lore all that kind of stuff and sat down and watched it again and and I have to admit, like like Josh Whedon has a certain writing style, and if you watch Serenity, just if you took up take that one episode of Serenity and you watch it, he bounces around, he introduces characters, he doesn't do that whole all those tropes about um what do you call it oh you know the the where you introduce a character and you have the sort of he just jumps into a character and they riff for a bit and then they jump out and go to another character and you're supposed to go you you get this feel, sort of feeling I'm supposed to know what's going on here but but they don't do that he does do the typical TV trope of like warming you up to the to what's happening kind of thing, right? And I found I found the first episode really disjointed, and I could see why. You know, if if you know Tammy, or, you know, remember her son telling telling her to, from her to me that that what was this done in year one? It is a very hard episode to watch, although it is fantastic from the point of view of how the characters are portrayed, because you know they've got the Western thing. Um, I looked up a few things online and I, I added them to the notes, but they seem to be missing anyway. But the one thing. I wanted to find out is why, like, the reason why they speak, they swear in Chinese is because um, at that point in the future, you know, the Indo-Chinese influence and the American influence have, have gotten together so that all of these people speak Chinese and commonly, I guess, English as we're supposed to understand them, right? So yeah. um, I, I, love, I love the fact that they all swear in Chinese. I've always loved that, right? Although I, I've been told by some of my friends who speak Chinese that their Chinese is abysmal. Yeah, well, I was going to say, like, it's, it, I, I kind of wonder, like, are they really talking Chinese or yes. they're just kind of muttering blah, blah, blah? No, apparently know? they were taught, they were taught everything on, in the moment phonetically. So they were just right. trying to make the sounds as they were hearing them from someone who was teaching them the terms and apparently did not quite nail it. But it it is a, a lovely little part of the show. And it's part of the character of the show. Like it. It really does feel like a possible future it, in a way that's very different than track or some of the other things that we enjoy. Like it does seem like, you know, the the, the premise that they give you, especially at the beginning of the, the Serenity movie where they say, you know, Earth that was was all used up. So we, we left and we found, you know, new places. We terraformed them. We made them into new Earths. And it was, you know, pretty rough from there. It makes sense. It really does. It, it makes sense as something that we could see ourselves doing. And again, that English and Chinese being sort of the last two dominant cultures again makes a lot of sense and and it really it 
it's just a, a sort of very to me, it feels very possible in a way that a lot of science fiction doesn't necessarily. It reminds me of my favorite part of the Foundation series, which, which is about the truckers, right? Like one of, one of the one of the first stories in the Foundation series, I think it's the second one, is about people, you know, taking goods out to the the outer rim planets, right? Where, where Luke Skywalker, where Skywalker hangs out. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I mean, and, and it's cool, and 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 you know, the whole the whole um, uh, Manchurian candidate factor with with River. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, like you know, it's it's funny how the how the and I guess I guess to sort of expand this conversation a bit because it also does expand out into everything that Josh Whedon has done since Firefly because there's influences of Firefly in Dollhouse and and you see and even Summer Gao who plays um, you know she's in she's in Big Bang Theory she's she played the the Terminator in the Sarah Connor Chronicles uh, I believe she was in Angel too right or something like that uh, I know I know that he's recycled a lot of his I don't his, remember uh, I know. No, um, not her, but uh, Gina Torres was on right. Angel, and Nate Fillion. Uh, oh, maybe she was in Dollhouse. I think. I think yeah, she I think, was in yeah. Dollhouse. He, right. he, a lot of the you're right. A lot of the actors he continued to use because they they canceled Firefly, and I think he felt bad about that. So Adam Baldwin. Um, yeah, and it's got a Baldwin brother or a Baldwin in. He's, he's in not the a show. Baldwin brother. He is a Baldwin, but he's not a Baldwin. I know, brother. but he's a cousin, cousin or something, isn't he? I don't think so. I think he's just mm. a Baldwin. But uh, right. Adam Baldwin plays Jane, who is of course a, a great character. So yeah. interesting. Uh, and he ended up coming on and being a character in the final season of Angel as well, too. So yeah, he he sort of gave a little bit more back to the the actors. I think he felt were sort of unfairly axed with this series, and I think that is also part of it. Too, that this series gained a lot of legs too because you know a lot of the actors from the show went on to even bigger things after this of course Nathan Fillion went on to be on Castle for nine years now he's on The Rookie and so he's had a lot of success from there Gina Torres has had a great career Alan Tudyk particularly of course he's been on uh, in the Star Wars films he's had lots of memorable roles last few years Marina Baccarin was one of the stars of Dead, the Deadpool movies and V uh, yeah absolutely and uh, you know Jewel State she was on uh, Stargate as well She's gone on to have another, you know, careers in movies. Like everybody's sort of gone on to other things too. And, and of course, Joss ended up directing one of the biggest movies of all time in the Avengers. So, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, the myths of this series has sort of built around it as well, because people are like, Oh, I love the, Oh, I love that person. I love that person. I really, you know, feel a lot of love for that character or that person. And then all of a sudden it's, Oh, they're on this other thing. Oh yeah. Have you seen <laughs> them do this other thing? I mean, in one of the episodes of castle, uh, castle dresses up as a space cowboy and it's his costume. It's Mal. <laughs> it's great. Oh, you know? is it really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I think there, it speaks to that sort of cult following and the love that people had for this series and this group of people. And I think that's kind of what drove them back to doing the film too. They, I think they just felt this, you know, like unfinished business. Like we, we had such a good time. They really, you can feel the chemistry. I think that's the thing that, that rewatching, and I did go back and rewatch it actually last year, coincidentally, just because um, my son hadn't seen it yet. So mm-hmm. Xavier and I sat down because I said, you know, I said, like, it's time. You got to sit down. We're in a pandemic. Let's sit down and just watch this thing. He said, sure. So we sat down and we watched it, you know, an episode at a time over the course of a couple of weeks. And he loved it. He thought it was fantastic. And he's like, I can't believe the same thing. Everybody says at the end, I'm sure you, Tammy, and you Bill feel <laughs> the same way. I can't believe they stopped at 14 episodes. They didn't even make it to 14 episodes they made to 11 episodes and they didn't even air the last three so it's it's really shocking and uh, that you know something this good could be so short yeah and uh, i mean nobody nobody's stepping up to buy the franchise nothing yeah i'm not even well, sure it's been a long time since it was out right yeah i'm not even sure who owns the rights anymore because it was not on fox i mean come but... on netflix bought trailer park boys i mean <laughs> come on yeah this but is way better deal. Yeah, yeah yeah fox it was bought by Disney. So I don't know who owns the rights to all this stuff now. I, I, I love the idea that, uh, that, you know, uh, Sir and River and, uh, yeah, River and all these characters are all Disney princesses now. But, um, I, yeah, I don't know who, who would get to do it if they were going to do it anyways. And if they were going to do it, we can get into the murky part 
for that. I don't know if Joss Whedon would be involved if they decided to do this, and I don't know if this would happen without Joss. So yeah, that's true. There'd be a lot of recasting. Well, I don't know. I don't know what they do. I mean, obviously, Ron Glass has passed away. He was he was the the shepherd, and he was such a great part of the show. Um, they did spoiler alert. And if you're this far in, you're out. Uh, the they did kill off his character in the movie, and and they did kill Alan Tudyk's character. So it could okay, bring that back was heartbreaking. Seven. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about it. Yeah, and we'll, we'll get more into Center Entity, but heartbreaking and unexpected. And come on, really? Well, it's funny. But you you are also a Buffy fan, right, uh, Tammy? Yes. The one thing that Joss has been great at is not Killing being precious about his love. characters. <laughs> absolutely, and you know, but you know what? Them. It's yeah, absolutely, and it's, he does he does it he does it throughout his series. He does it in Buffy. He does it in Angel. He he does it in this. He does it in Dollhouse. He does it again in the Avengers. Killed movies. off a bunch of Avengers too. Absolutely. Yeah. So he is he is known for this, and yet people still don't see it coming. And I, I will say, it's used to perfection. And I'll just jump ahead a bit, but it's used to perfection in Serenity because Serenity in all places, when they kill off Book, you're like, well, he's not really on the ship anymore. He's an older character. I guess mm-hmm. it makes sense. Somebody's got to go. Fine. But when they go forward about 15 minutes and they kill Wash and it happens very suddenly, especially in the moment of his triumph, because he just lands the ship and he saves everybody and he's the hero and then he dies. And he's a leaf on the wind. He's a leaf on the wind. Watch how he soars. And yeah. and it's just gutting in that moment. But at the same time, then they cut to the scene where they're holding off the Reavers and everybody keeps getting shot, stabbed, hit with blow darts, all these different things happening. In that moment, you're genuinely thinking, oh, so this is like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Nobody gets out alive. What a great way to come at this. You know, it's 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 Rogue One. It's the idea that these are the, you know, the last people and they're going to die for this cause. And and you really aren't sure in that moment. Well, they just killed Book and then they killed Wash. Geez, maybe he's going to kill everybody. And it really, it ups the tension. It ups the stakes. It makes it way more compelling end to a film where you're like, gosh, I'm not sure anybody's going to live out of this. And you can't get that without... Again, not being precious. So Wash is a beloved character. To kill him off in that moment was ballsy. Yeah, a lot of episodes. I mean, I, I, I thought they were all going to die robbing the train. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. You, no, it's you, you guys talk about why hasn't anyone picked up the series and how come it hasn't continued and so on and so forth. And I look at it as well, yeah, maybe back in the day it would have been really good to have this strung out over I don't even know what Joss was planning. I think it was like a seven season run. I don't even remember. Yeah. I did mm-hmm. I did yeah. a whole reading on it and I completely forgot. But then you watch Serenity, the movie, and you're like, well, yeah, thanks for wrapping everything up. And I don't know where you can go from here. So I don't, I don't, I wouldn't, I don't know that I'd watch a pickup of this show. But I can say that even if you never watched the series, you can come into the movie and watch it from start to finish and really enjoy it if you know nothing about the series. And that's really what I think is key to what makes, uh, not only the series, but the movie incredible in its writing and its direction and the character work. And wait, what have you done with Tammy? Right. I, so, okay. So <laughs> again, full disclosure, right? Like Tim came to me in 2016 and possibly even before 2015, yeah, I was just saying possibly even before then about how cool Firefly is and how I should watch it. And for whatever reason, I don't know. It is very shiny. Um, came to me and said, you should watch the show. And I was like, yeah, whatever. And so I put it off and then I did try and watch it. As Tim said, I did try and watch it and I hate to bring in other shows into this conversation, but a similar thing happened when I tried to watch another show, Bob's Burgers. Someone was like, oh, you should watch this. And I was like, okay, fine. And I tried to watch episode one. I was like, this is awful. Why, Why would I even watch this? And I put it away. I put it away for, I don't even know how long I put it away. I put it on the shelf. I'm like, I'm not watching this. It's dumb. I don't like it. And then I went back to it and I watched the first episode or two of Bob's Burgers. I was like, oh my God, 
gosh, this is great. I love Louise. I love Bob. And Linda, she's my favorite. And sort of like the same thing happened with Firefly. Like, you know, I, I tried to watch it with my son and he was like, oh, what was this made in year one? I'm like, yeah, this is stupid. You're right. I'm not watching this. Tim's crazy. What the heck? And I put it away. And then, like I said earlier, I don't know if Tim is going to cut the conversation we had out earlier, but I said earlier that, you know, one of the things my husband and I found that we enjoy during this whole process of the, you know, the pandemic and, and so on and so forth is that we just want to spend a, a little bit of time together in the morning, just him and I just doing, you know, mindless stuff, whether it be watching television or just ha having a chat, which the two of us are totally mindless. But so we started watching Firefly because I knew eventually Tim was going to be like, hey, did you watch it yet? So we did. And we started watching it and it was brilliant. I was like, oh my gosh, I've been missing this this whole time. And like Tim said, like I was supposed to just watch, you know, an episode and then have a podcast with you guys and watch another episode and have a podcast with you guys. But I couldn't stop myself. And <laughs> it was so good. Like, so Bill and I watched the first episode and we were still like, I didn't like him. And I don't know if he can speak for himself, but I don't know that we immediately fell in love with it on the first episode, but we were intrigued. We were like, wow, this is really good storytelling. I wonder where this is going. I fell in love with Kaylee immediately. I was like, oh gosh, she's like my hero. I totally love her. And then we were like, okay, let's, let's watch this again. I don't know if we watched the second episode that morning or if we were like, okay, we're going to put this on our list of things to do because we like to watch one series at a time and we liked it. So we were going to watch it again. So we watched it and then like we were just watching it for, you know, what, it's 14 episodes. So we watched it pretty much in like two weeks. And then, you know, as Tim said, I sent him a message. I'm like, I'm done. I watched it. This is so cool. And then, then we were like, okay, so where we can, we can get the Serenity movie movie and boom we watched that and and it was just like the storytelling the character growth the the just i don't know everything was just so fun and so intriguing and so and they even had zombies i know they're called reavers but they were basically zombies and it was like wow this is great and if anyone listening to this show i'm going to sound so like tim right now if anyone listening to this show has not watched firefly or serenity you're totally missing out man you gotta watch it <laughs> i want that on a t-shirt with your picture <laughs> right <laughs> we we've actually had guests we we uh, it's it's very easy because we usually have tammy and i do another podcast we've done them for years and we have guests on and we always end up talking about star wars or star trek or whatever and i always say to the guest have you watched firefly and they're like oh my god yes and then tammy's just you know you can see the smoke coming out of her ears right um all this whole time and one of our best friends is is John Wilker and he's been on the show a couple of times and we've interviewed him and we had this thing called the, the chaos questions and one of the questions is who inspires you and he always says Malcolm Reynolds oh well, that was my answer on roundabout as well yeah that's true that's and true yeah. I remember being uh, so someone on the podcast being quite derisive in my choice <laughs> <laughs> now, how do you by feel? Who? By me, I can't imagine. How do you feel that. now, Tammy? Uh, Is Mal not one of the great sci-fi characters? So you know why he's so cool? Because mm. he is everything a leader should be. Like he's a dick. I'm sorry. Can I say that? Like, are you gonna like zap yeah, me you out? Say that that yeah, one you can say. That. Okay. Yep. I'll try and clean it up. He's a jerk, but he he also has this respect and love for his crew where like he's mm -hmm. all like cavalier about yeah whatever go off and die i'm gonna leave you yeah but this is my crew yeah, yeah exactly. it's yep. okay so it's I, all right here's here's the thing and and if my brother ever listens to this podcast i apologize if he is offended by this but my brother used to have this saying and maybe i'm misremember misremembering it but it was like i can beat up my little sister but you can't right and that's kind of exactly. like how yeah. i feel about mal like i can i can beat up my crew but you better not because they're my crew. I love them and I'm not going to let anything happen to them. So I can totally see why John and, and Jonathan are like, yeah, Mal is totally 
someone that I look up to and, and someone. Well, totally how he figures out that Jane sold out the doctor and, yeah. and his sister. Yeah. Like that, like, I mean, that's like a plot twist that you don't see coming. Because how could he possibly know other than the fact that he really knows Jane well, right? Well, he knows his yeah. crew. He knows these people. It's not, it's not just someone he shows up to work with every day and, and they have random chit chat on the side. Like, in every conversation he has, he's learning more about his crew. He's learning what makes them tick, what motivates them, what will, what will cause them to go off and, and sell somebody else out on his crew. And he, he doesn't he doesn't mince words like he he's just he's yeah. I don't know why I waited so long to watch this stupid series. <laughs> <laughs> well, OK, let, let me ask you let me ask you some questions and we, maybe we can Jonathan can think of some questions, too. But like, so what do you think about the relationship between Malcolm Reynolds and Inara? Like they're sort of the Sam and Diane of this show, although they ruin Sam, Sam and Diane by putting them together. Well, but. you can say the same thing about the the uh, Bruce Willis and and what's her name on Moonlighting? Yes, yeah. Civil Shepherd Moonlighting. Yeah, Moonlighting. Yeah, exactly. You can exactly. say the same thing about yeah. Fox and Mulder or Fox Mulder mm-hmm. and, and Scully. You know, it's they never get together. Yeah, they did. No, they, well, did they? yeah, they oh, did in the man. movie. They kissed. They totally kissed. So I mean, like, anyway, so, every- but yeah, so let's get back to to Mal and Nanara and their relationship and how you know they professionally can't be involved and and they have this but sort they of love can thing professionally going. be involved. Like I don't know which one of them is like, oh well, I can't professionally, you know, I can't be involved with you because we're pro- that's just silly. It's just silly, Tim. Yeah, yeah, I know. And it, well, Nanara gets her knickers in a twist when when Mrs. Reynolds comes along, right? Yeah, and which is a great character. Oh, it, too, was, by the way. it was awful too when um. What's her face got shot on that? Oh yeah, Kaylee gets shot. Yeah. No, not Ka- the, the one he uh, he he had a thing with. Okay, so remember that? I don't remember what episode it was, but he went down to the planet. Oh, the with, with the horrors, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and yeah, he, he sure. hooked up with the, the madam, and then she ended up you know dying in that fight, and it was like it was heart wrenching. Mm. And like I don't know, I think those two should have gotten together. I really do. Well, well, you yeah, think and, if and they kept the show going, they would have, right? Like, it, it seemed inevitable. Yeah, but it would have ruined it. Well, then maybe that's why this show is this perfect thing. Maybe this is why the show is so captured people so, because there's all these unfinished threads, right? Like, you wonder if they had done seven seasons, if we'd be like, it was fine, but like, it really jumped a shark after Anara and Mal got together. Yeah, yeah. Well, but didn't Dollhouse also get canceled early? It did. Actually, Fox, wary of the backlash that they felt by the Serenity fans, after Firefly was canceled, they gave him runway. They said, we're, we're going to end your show after two seasons. Wrap up your story. And so he, he basically had a runway to finish at least season two. And he knew it was coming so he could actually write an ending. Which is, I guess, yeah, you know, it felt rushed. Yeah. It, it certainly does. If you if you see the pacing from season one to season two of Dollhouse, it changes completely. So how can they how could they do that after like again? How could they do that after the success of Buffy and the success of Angel? Like, because of the ratings, you know. Wrong? The problem, and again, if you go back and look at it too, it's it's pathetic because now we live in an era where like a massive success for a show is like you know a few million people because there's so much division in where people are watching things and when. But then. A show on a Friday night on Fox that gets like 5 million people. They're like, oh, this is a waste. We have to cancel the show. So it's it's really just a circumstance of its era, too. That's true. That's true. You know, one thing that I I remember now about the, well, in terms of my vague recollections of 20 years ago is um, the companion character being called a whore like a very Mm -hmm. high number of times throughout the series. And I'm now realizing, oh, yeah, that's why I was a little confused when, you know, I'm also new to the Doctor. Doctor Who universe of you all talking about companion and some like companion companion. Why does that keep coming to mind? Like, oh, that's right. It's from Firefly, and it's a completely different sort of meaning. Yeah. Well, and it, and it's an interesting concept too, as a care as a as a job goes, because she's not just the W word. She's actually a professional at this. She's a professional escort or whatever we want to call her. And and you know they have like rules and regulations and prime directives and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, it's, and, and, and it's, rigorous they've taken testing it, and you know, they've taken not. it to like a much higher level she has to go back to you know once a year she has to go back and you know get reindoctrinated and and whatever it is they they practice and you know their skill and um it's an amazing kind of character because if you think about it and we were pretty uptight 20 years ago especially on television uh, t- on tv right and and to have a character like that be so far out there right so it's kind of 
interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of stuff like that. I mean, the, the part of the tension between, you know, Mal and, and Inara is the fact that he doesn't respect what she does, even though he loves her and respects her and she doesn't respect what he does, that the petty, petty thievery and all that. You know, she calls him a petty thief all the time too. Well, because it's, it's, it can it jeopardize her, her you know, license or whatever. Right? I see. Yeah. I don't think it's a matter of a lack of respect as much as it is that they want to be together, but neither one one of them is going to say, I want to be with you. I don't think it has anything to do with a lack of respect. I think that's an excuse for both of them, honestly. Yeah, yeah, I could read. So what were the standout moments for you, Bill, and, and you, Tammy? What were the ones that jumped out at you having just gone through this? You know, the, the, the episodes that really jumped out and said, like, oh, man, like, this is great TV. You know, I think, honestly, all of them. As I said, that, that first one, it was a little... You know, because it, it, I was going to say it's dated, but it's really not. Like, even when, you know, 20 years later, it's still pretty good TV. Um, I think just, gosh, I'm trying to think what, what, what would be a standout episode. I can't pick one. Like, they were all pretty good. <laughs> okay, so maybe maybe one of the interesting things, and, and you have to forgive me. Some I, I don't know if this was from the movie or the series, but when River just beat up all those guys in a bar. Yeah, it's a movie. That's the movie. Was it yeah. the movie? Okay. Yeah. Because that was pretty amazing. And she beats up the Reavers too, you know. Yeah. Okay, so by then I knew what was gonna happen. I knew I knew when they were all pinned down and, and everybody and, and, and Wash had already died and everybody had been stabbed and, and Mal was, you know, pretty much on his last breath there. I knew what was going to happen. I knew when when her brother got hit in the side that she was gonna go out and kill all the Reavers because bar scene so i wasn't i wasn't surprised there um gosh but other than that i'm trying to think about like what what i don't know i don't know that i could pick one out they were all just so good and we watched them all almost back to back so it was, they sort of just blended into each other yeah and they there are different like they're very different episodes i think that's one of the strengths it's 14 different episodes and you know there is sort of a theme of you know the sort of petty crime and stuff like that but there is a lot of variety in there too you know the episode where they they go to Ariel and they try and help Simon smuggle River into the hospital so she can have the diagnostic and they're trying to steal the stuff out. It's a heist movie, right? It's a good one hour tight heist movie. But then you get something like Out of Gas where the you know the, the crew has to leave the ship and Mal's trying to get the part and then he gets wounded and it flashes back and tells the story of their lives. Like a very different type of storytelling, very different type of story. Um, my my all time favorite episode and it, you're, you're right Tammy, I can't, you know, it's hard to part but I love Janestown, the one where they go to the planet oh, with the mothers. Yeah, and they had that statue of him. That was great. The the parts where you know they 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 see the statue and they're like, huh? So this is what going crazy feels like. Like it's just you know they are so just dumbstruck that anybody could worship Jane Cobb, and it's just it's so funny and it's so clever and you know and and yet it's a really interesting exploration of who Cobb is and who he wants to be and you know like there's just there's a lot of stuff on these episodes to really get into you know the recurring character of Saffron the the um, the the um Oh, Mrs. Reynolds. Mrs. Reynolds, yeah. You know, the, of course, having Christina oh, Hendricks before right. this is before Mad Men, right? Christina Hendricks, this is the first time I ever saw her and was like, God, she's gonna be she's just gonna be a star. She's great. And she comes on and she plays the ingenue who comes in and then turns out she's trying to steal the ship. Okay, and then so she I, comes back again and I totally knew where that was going. I knew that when she got on the ship that she was not who she was made out to be. I knew mm-hmm. I knew going in, I'm like, no man, she is a she She's there to do something that is not what she's saying she's going to do. And sure enough, you know, she was a con, you know. Yeah. And it played beautifully. Yep. And it was so funny because, you know, that just the way that they played that off where where Mal was just really trying to be the good guy and, and just be a gentleman and do everything and then totally got seduced. And then, you know, with the lipstick thing and boom, he was out cold. And then Anara had the same thing happen pretty much it was great yeah exactly and then she denies it through the whole rest of the show oh my gosh that was great yeah Yeah. but then to bring her back a few 
episodes later for for the episode where they they try and steal the the rare gun, right? Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. so good. And that episode again, it it just it's another sort of heisty kind of thing. But you know the way the story sort of weaves back and forth. You know, naked Mal stuck in the desert with his you know clothes off, and the, the, like there's just there's so many great little weaves together. There's only a few episodes where I'm like, eh, I can take it or leave it. The one as you mentioned, the one with the the uh, the uh, brothel. You know, it's fine. But, you know, again, I think all of us were like, eh, does, does he have to rush out and have, you know, an affair with the one woman like that's going to totally break and in ours? Heart. Freak out. And, exactly. yeah, 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 it seemed yeah. a little bit sort of, you know, yeah. Um, and yeah, same thing with Niska, right? They brought in the character of Niska. That's the one that Tim mentioned. They they brought in like, you know, this this guy comes. He's going to, you know, going to stop. They had to steal the stuff off the train. And then they find out that it's actually medicine that's needed to save all these lives. So they decide to give it back. And then Niska is going to come and get them. And then it kicks the guy through the, the uh, engine. Um, yeah, that's Jaime mentioned. And then then they bring it back around where Niska catches, you know, Wash and, and uh, Mal. And they make, he makes uh, Zoe. So we have to choose which one, which life she can buy back from him with all that they've got. And she and says, "Wash." Yeah, him. Like, <laughs> no question. Him. Yeah. <laughs> no, and the best part is when they're both being tortured, and you know he's trying to get them to talk, and and so Mal and and Wash all their t- they they totally throw him off by talking about why Mal has never slept with <laughs> with. Um, yeah, Zoe. Zoe, yeah, Zoe. Thank you. Yeah, and the whole relationship of Zoe and Wash, and the fact that when the when the their old dead comrade, the old brown coat, shows up in the in the coffin, and he's like, I can't believe Zoe's in a relationship. I can't <laughs> believe she smiles. You know? Yeah, yeah. See, I didn't. All right, if we're talking about episodes we didn't like, that one is probably one I didn't like. Yeah, it was a weaker one. Yeah, yeah for sure. I, you know, because it's, well, it's like, very slow. It's a slow episode. It is, and I thought the relationship between Mal and Zoe. Was was what I would expect, right? It's it's they have that camaraderie, but they also have that respect for each other where they don't need to sleep with each other. You know, they're they're right, just right. for some reason people think that because you know you're supposed to be the opposite sex and be attracted to each other that you can't have a friendship. And it's like, well, mm. no, that's not true. You can totally be the opposite sex and not be sexually attracted to each other. You don't have to sleep with each other just because your best friends and have this camaraderie and i really liked that you know they showcase that you can have a relationship with somebody and not sleep with them you you can just Mm. be friends like wow imagine that (laughs) what are the odds and i also watched i was watching some of the conversations between like you know anara and and kaylee and the other other like the female characters on the show and it doesn't pass the bechtel test because every single conversation they have is about another man Mm -hmm. which is you know typical of that type of time i guess you know yeah and it's a it's a struggle too because uh, you know and again we can get into a joss whedon conversation here too but you know whedon was lauded early in his career especially in the in the 90s for developing these unique and song female characters obviously starting with buffy summers but when you sort of look at them through the lens of 2021 versus the lens of 1996 there are certainly some things that, you know, like they are a little bit one dimensional in some areas. There's certainly some stuff that they could have done better. And there's certainly some of the better episodes of those shows are not necessarily Josh's doing so much as they are some of the fantastic, you know, Jane Espenson and some of the amazing female writers that they had on that show, too. So, um, yeah, again, I don't know how far we want to go down the rabbit hole, obviously, with with all the accusations that have come out about, you know, Joss Whedon and his behavior and you know, I think that's the one thing that's kind of sad now looking at this show, too, is I think even the, you know, I think all brown coats, all of us who have loved this show for, you know, 20 years almost have always had it in the back of our mind. You know, it really is just a matter of time before somehow they'll get the gang back together and they'll do something. There's got to be more of this to tell. And yet now with, you know, these, these uh, stories that have come out related to the justice league film that, that Joss Whedon helped uh, do, do the final uh, cut of the original version and directed the end of that. Uh, and then some, some of the actors from Buffy and angel coming out and talking about him being, uh, you know, not, not a pleasant influence on those sets. 
you know, it, it seems an awful lot like, you know, that th- this is going to be the end of, of, you know, the Joss Whedon verse. Joss Whedon run, yeah. Which mm-hmm. is, again, it's, 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 it's awful that, that that's the, the denouement of all this. Because when you look back at all these shows, there's so much good there. There's so many good characters. There's so much, you know, to be done. And, and characters live on in, in comic books and in different well, media. Had, and, but Joss Whedon didn't just write this stuff. He also wrote other shows, too, like um, Before Buffy and all that, too. Well, he, he, he wrote the screenplay for Toy Story, you know? I mean, this, yeah, Toy this, Story, right. That's what I'm thinking about. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he was, you know, prodigious and, you know, was a real golden boy as he was coming up through, you know, through Hollywood. And yeah, I mean, it's it's really, really sad that, that the, the, the sort of coda to all of these stories is, but that guy apparently wasn't a nice guy. And, and that's unfortunate, really. And, and, and I'm, obviously, I'm, not, I'm very, 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 very much diminishing uh, what he's been accused of to say he's not a nice guy. Guy. Obviously, none of it's been proven, and you know these are you know uh, he said she said situations, but you know the totality of it looks like it's a it's a very bad situation. And and when you look at it now, you're like, geez, you know, I always had in my mind right up until when this sort of last burst, even when there were some rumors that you know things weren't that great on the second Avengers movie or they weren't that great in Justice League movie. I thought, well, you know, so he goes and he lies low. He had a pretty pretty acrimonious divorce from his wife, and there was accusations of of you know in appropriate relationships and other stuff. And I thought, well, okay. So maybe he goes to Hollywood jail for a while. And then, you know, a few years later he comes back and says, Oh, well, I've learned my lesson and, and, you know, I'll try and be a better person. But boy, it seems like the snowball has just, you know, rolled so far down the hill. It does. It's really hard to see it going back up again. Yeah. And we have this conversation a lot on the show where, where you, how do you separate the art from the artist, the artist, right? Like mm-hmm. the art is so good, but the person sucks. <laughs> I think I'm a uh, professional at being able to separate people from what they do and what they make or create. Right. Yeah. But but you got to remember the person that they are informs their art too, right? The way I look at it is in in what I'm watching in Serenity and in Firefly and in Buffy and and all those Avengers other movies. things. Yeah. Yeah. I see strong female characters. I see a strong sense of camaraderie between a team of people. You know, on Buffy, it was the Scooby gang and, and it was mm-hmm. it was led by a very powerful woman, right? There's nobody more powerful than a vampire slayer. Mm-hmm. Um, and with Firefly, you know, there was a lot of strong women in that. Zoe was strong. Uh, Kaylee was strong. Anara was strong. And, you know, she... If if we're going to go to to sexuality and whatnot, you know, she definitely was very fluid in that. And I I don't know. I I guess maybe I'm the outlier here, but I look at those things and I think, you know, this this is powerful storytelling. This is great storytelling. There, and I said it earlier in the show. It's just you've got these characters and they're there to tell a story, and the actors and the actresses bring that character alive. And and certain parts of this one and certain parts of that one resonate with who I am and I can connect with them on a deeper level because, you know, I have a little bit of Mal in me. I have a little bit of an R in me. I have a little bit of Kaylee and I certainly have a whole lot of Buffy in me. <laughs> so it, it's just like, I guess I see all of these aspects and I'm able to separate the man who made these characters from the characters that he made. I'm just watching a television show or a movie or reading a book and I'm there for that experience alone. I look at a person's art for the art. I don't look at the art for the person who made the art. I'm sure they have their own story to tell and that's their story. I love me a good Buffy. I love me a good Inara. I love me a good Mal and I can't really say much more than that, you know? If you enjoyed this and you are someone who does partake of comic books, there is a continuation of this universe in the comic world, the Dark Horse comics. There's a great bridge comic that actually takes place. There's actually several that take place between Firefly and Serenity. The one I recommend most is called Those Left Behind, which actually explains the fate of the men with the blue hands, two by two men in hands Ooh. of blue. So that is worth picking up. It's only a three issue series. So you can pick up the issues. You can pick up. There's a collected edition. Definitely worth a read. It does kind of wrap up a little bit of that storyline and gets you into getting ready for serenity and there have been a few other series since then uh, that are worth reading um 
there's one called Float Out that's really good. There's one called Leaves on the Wind. There's that focus is obviously on Wash, really good. Um, definitely more material out there if you're into it. And these are sanctioned by Whedon as as sort of you know canonical. So worth checking out. And for the record, Tammy and Bill, worth opening that box set because the audio commentaries on the episodes, they have the actors, they'll have the creators, lots of interesting insight, lots of fun character stuff, lots of jokes. And then and the gag reels and the behind the scenes stuff is terrific. Well worth getting into. Oh, you're just trying to make my box set worth less. I know how <laughs> this goes. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what, when we go to Tennessee next, we'll give you a second, we'll give you the Blu-ray box set. And then, well, yeah, but you know what the, uh, the, the, uh, I'm sure that that I told, I was telling Tammy about this earlier, about the, the behind the scenes thing that Joss Whedon does where he walks through the entire ship. Oh, right? it's, a, in it's fact, they, an amazing set, but they do that in the, in the, in the movie too, if you remember, because they follow Mal through yeah, the, the whole whole opening shot, shot is one big shot. Yeah, there's actually Listen, there's a break there, but I'm not gonna lie. Before I watched the first episode, I got on the internet and I looked up all this stuff that Tim has been whispering in my ear for you know four <laughs> or five years about it being out of order and all the backstory. And I learned a whole bunch of Did stuff. Did you know Jane has that woolly hat in the last episode? What? <laughs> <laughs> the one that's like on all the ski slopes. The one his mom sends them, yeah. Oh. Yeah, every every trope about Firefly has Jane with that hat on and it's in the last episode. Oh. Well, I was talking well, more about like books backstory that they never got a chance to yeah. tell and just all that stuff. I watched bloopers, I watched things you missed in Firefly or ten of the funniest bloopers. I just went off on a binge is what I did. Nice. Yeah. Nice. And I'm well, not opening my box set, JP. <laughs> no, we, need, we, need, we need link. We need links for the uh, for the uh, broadcast for that. Yeah. yeah, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. So we're now three episodes, or if you like, halfway through the season. Ooh. Is everybody up to date? Have we watched the show? Can we spoil yeah, of things? Of course we have, except for Tammy. We, we have. Yeah, yeah, I totally watched all of it. Season twelve, right? Is that what we're up to? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that exactly is, is exactly where we're. It. Uh, I, I'm curious to see what everybody thinks about sort of what we've had so far. I can't it, believe it's only going to be three, three or six shows. That's really well, weird. They, you they, know? they took a different path than than One Division. One Division did, I think it was a nine episodes, but they did shorter mm-hmm. episodes, whereas Falcon and the Winter Soldier is doing longer episodes, but only six. Apparently the running time is identical. So Wait, who's Falcon? I don't have a problem with Falcon is uh, <laughs> a character from Marvel Comics. Oh, yeah. I knew that. No, I... Do you know who the Winter Soldier is? Nope. I know. I, hey, I kind of watched WandaVision with one eyeball. Did you watch Captain America Winter Winter Soldier, the film? I did in, not. Did not. If you're going to watch a Marvel movie, that would be my recommendation. It is, in my opinion, the strongest film that they made and that the whole run so far. It's just a really, really enjoy. If you take the costumes out of it, it's just a great spy thriller. The fact that it has all mm-hmm. the Marvel, you know, touches and the characters and the epic grandeur and everything else is nice, but it's just a really, really good spy movie. And this one sort of picks up the two characters that are introduced there, which is Falcon, who is a uh, military veteran who has this special suit that allows him to fly. And the Winter Soldier, who was Cap's best friend in World War II, he was supposedly killed in action, but actually he was captured by the Russians and had his mind altered to become their ultimate assassin. And now he's sort of back to being on the good side of things, but he's dealing with a very, very dark past where he killed a lot of people against his own will. So you get these really interesting layered characters, and they're both in this show under this very, very huge shadow cast by Steve Rogers, Captain America, who has decided to retire and give up the mantle of Captain America and leave these two to sort of carry on the legacy in their own way. So that's sort of where we start off with. Where we go from there has been a really interesting ride and a really neat look 
deeper at these characters. Very different than WandaVision. Way, way less. I mean, there's there's certainly some mystery elements to this show. You know, who's who's the power broker? Who are the big bads? Why, you know? But a lot of it is really about these two men, their relationship, and the relationship they have with this specter of Captain America. And I think so far they're kind of killing it. Yeah, and, so, and the character that Wyatt, Wyatt uh, Russell plays, um, of course, he's famously the son and of Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn. Mm-hmm. But um, the character he plays though, is actually from the comic books, right? Like, this is, isn't there a second Cap? Or I mean, there's several Captain Americas, but isn't he one of them? Yes. So uh, <laughs> we're back into my old school. I bought those comics when they were new. Captain America at one point ends up in a conflict with the U.S. government where uh, this is a storyline from the 1980s, actually. So it's, it's been a while where he ends up in conflict with the U.S. government. They basically say, listen, if you're going to wear the red, white and blue and you're going to work on our turf, you need to take orders from us. And he says, no, I'm a, I'm a free agent. I do what's right. And they say, well, then you can't be Captain America anymore. And he says, fine, I quit. And what continued from there was about a year long story, a little more than a year, year and a half story in the Captain America comics where he quits and goes off and does his own thing as a separate hero and uh, just calling himself the captain, uh, which now sounds like a, a spice rum commercial, but he, <laughs> he thanks captain obvious. Yeah, exactly. He decides he's going to be the captain and they decide, well, let's find another guy. And so they, they find um, John Walker and John Walker becomes captain America and uh, his sidekick um, becomes the new Bucky. And so it's the story about, you know, well, you know, can this guy handle this kind of pressure and everything else? And sort of goes from there in the show. They're kind of handling it a little differently in that Falcon willingly gives up the shield because he doesn't think that he's cut out to be Captain America. And there's some really interesting undertones about, you know, being black in America tied to that. And then the government, without talking to him about the donation of the shield, basically gives the shield to this new guy and says, well, you know, America needs a Captain America. Here's our new Captain America. He's this guy. Here you go. And really sort of just casts him as a much more, I mean, he's kind of a whinger, but he's, he's also more likable. Like he seems like he's got popular appeal. Nobody's like, Oh, you're not Captain America. They seem to, they seem to have embraced him, but I, I would expect we'll see a sharp heel turn in the next few episodes. Yeah, he does look goofy, I have to say. <laughs> well, he does America. look And it's funny because Wyatt Russell, I've seen him in a few different things, and he's, I think, a good actor, and I think he's a handsome man, but that costume that comes down I over think it's the, the ears. <laughs> it, it's, I think it's his chin. He's got a very wide chin, and it makes it makes his chin look kind of goofy. Yeah. But yeah, um, but yeah he's, he's sort of, you know, walking around, and it almost looks like a kid playing dress-up, right? Like, he looks like, somebody pointed out and put a meme on, online that was uh him and it was the little kid at the beginning of the incredibles right you know i'm uh incredible boy where it's like you know i'm a little kid but i'm dressed up like my favorite hero that's what the Warrior russell kind of looks like in this he looks like a little kid dressed up like captain america yeah I, I, again I'm, I'm i'm digging what they're doing so far i think it was interesting because the first episode focused on the two characters individually The second one brought them together and the third one brought them together and then had this antagonist in there in Zemo. And Mm -hmm. so we've had these sort of different looks at the characters and the way they interact with with them by themselves and the problems they're going through and then how they're sort of uneasy with each other. And then you add in this sort of rogue element in Zemo and it's made for three sort of very different types of episodes, but very, very interesting episodes, I think. What are you guys making of it so far? Yeah, and and the the girl from the Captain America movies. uh, Yeah, from Winter's Oh, yeah, that's uh, mm-hmm. Sharon Carter sure. played by Emily Van Camp. Can we, um... Yeah, is that the, and that's um, she's the niece of she's Peggy Carter's niece. Peggy Carter's niece. Yeah, yeah, from Port Perry, Ontario. Woohoo! Represent. Yeah, I'm. I'm actually enjoying it. Surprisingly, like um, I kind of you know uh, these are sort of side characters to me. I mean, I <laughs> like you know having watched the uh, the Winter Soldier movie, it's tough to sort of to, for me to connect that that he's now a good guy. I know he's in Black Panther and he's a pivotal character in other movies that people may not have seen, so I won't go into those. But um, you know, uh, yeah, because he go he goes off to the to uh, Wakanda to heal, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they yeah. do. He comes back. He's the 
villain in Winter Soldier and then sort of has this glimmer of hope. And then he's a stronger character, gets framed by Zemo in Captain America Civil War. Right, and then right. is sort of more thoroughly redeemed and then goes to Wakanda to sort of find peace and try and be healed by the Wakandans. Yeah, I watched the Civil War movie again to catch up on because I did actually, it was very helpful to go back through the, the, the Legends, is it called, I think, on Disney Plus? Yeah, those little mini, mini episodes that recap the characters. Those are great. Yeah. And at the end of it, they also tell you which movies the clips are from. And it's kind of, so it kind of is pointed to looking, rewatching, because I wanted to find out about the, the uh, Sarah, Sarah Carter, what's her name? Again? Sharon, Sharon Carter. Sharon Carter. I wanted to find out her thing. I probably have to go back and watch Captain America. I think that's the one where she shows up to protect him, right? Uh, she shows up in Captain America Winter Soldier. That's the first okay. time we see her. Right. Um, anyway, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm surprisingly enjoying this. I mean, you know, a little tough. I, I'm really disliking Captain America or whatever they call him. I think him. you're and supposed then, to, right? And that other guy? That other guy? The, the, well, I think the they're calling him Battlestar. Leroy, yeah. Battlestar, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the man with no name. But yeah. um, Oh, sorry, Lamar. Lamar, not Leroy. Lamar. Yeah, so I mean, it, it is it is enjoyable. And But again, like I said, like I'm, I'm finding it hard to sort of get my head wrapped, wrapped around this, like only three episodes left, right? So, which is good. It's a, it's a good sort of, you know, carry on the, the sort of story. Because I mean, you know, the Avengers movie is, or the last Avengers movie, and game is that the last one uh well last avengers movie is endgame the last marvel movie is uh spider-man yeah no no but i mean endgame because it can it's kind of you know and i i like the way that they carry on the sort of the blip and all that kind of stuff but i mean the i you know the the uh endgame is very sort of climatic like you know they they get rid of thanos and and whatever and where are they going to go from here and it's you know now that tony stark is spoilers dead um you know they really can't sort of go down that whole sort of that whole rabbit hole with with the whole Avengers group, unless it, I guess, but I know in comic books they have what the new Avengers and the Avengers Next Generation and there have Avengers been a lot Voyager. of yes, yeah, yeah. a lot of different uh, characters, yeah, and the Avenger Lower Decks and yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly yeah. So, anyway, what do you think, Jaime? I'm liking it. It's a it's definitely a little bit of a different kind of show in that it's it is more um, more like uh, the Winter Soldier movie than it is the completely out there WandaVision. So it's a little it's a little jarring seeing um, a, a kind of more normal show over uh, the the very crazy WandaVision. Um, I, I can see why Disney probably would have wanted to lead with this one, but I, I like it for different reasons. And I think the, the quips between the, the two title characters are, are probably the best part for me. Seeing them sort of like, uh, I don't know, like um, almost like lethal weapon style, grudgingly accepting each other sort of thing. Yeah. Do you guys, have you guys sort of, you know, it's not WandaVision. It's certainly not the sort of puzzle, you know, what is the big, you know, who's the big bad how's this all although there is that right like they've introduced a little bit of that with this this sort of mysterious power broker and you know what's the sort of overarching role of some of these different things but are, are you guys finding yourself sort of investing in the big you know where the show is going or is it really more of a character thing for you i think it's a character thing at this point in time i'm really not cementing the storyline in sense in that sense like, except for the you know they have to they have to find a way to usurp or get the shield back is how they they put it in the show right um to sort of usurp this new this this poser <laughs> captain american right um as well as the sort of yeah the sort of the 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 russian sort of uh super agent kind of you know chemically induced you know superpower people yeah and so yeah they introduced this these sort of characters you're not sure who they are and it, it turns out that they're they're this group of uh self-styled freedom fighters who are trying to protect the rights of people who have been displaced by the snap or the or the blip as right, they call right. it yeah uh, and they've taken a new version of the super soldier serum. And so now the mystery is, you know, how many people have taken it? How many doses are out there, which they actually did resolve this week and said that there's 20 doses, but we don't know how many of those have been taken. So the question is, you know, as part of this, you know, do we see, you know, does does Wyatt Russell's character think he needs an edge and take, you know, find a dose and take it himself? Oh, really? You yeah. know, like where, where do these things go from there? You know, like where, where are the, because right now Wyatt Russell's kind of an annoying character but he's not an inherently bad character an evil character or malicious you know he certainly is very eager to prove himself but he's not a bad person i don't think well they kind of in the, when they introduce this character he's kind of in the, the locker room yeah trying yeah. to get his head into the fact that he's got to be captain america right yeah, yeah. and it's good I'm, I'm glad that they're giving him some layers the john walker that they initially introduced in the comics was 
far more brash, militaristic, you know, buff character, you know, but then you think about when that character was created, it was, you know, late 1980s, different era, you know, different vibe. Again, think of the movies that were popular in that era, the, you know, the Rambos and the Terminators and all that kind of stuff. So it, it makes sense that he's a different character now with more nuance and, and everything else. But I think if you're going to have him be this person who you don't feel bad when inevitably Sam or or, or Bucky end up with a shield, you you don't want to feel bad for this guy. You want to think like, yeah, good, screw that guy, right? So he's got to mm-hmm. have a bit of a he's got to have a yeah. bit more of a heel turn where people are like, oh yeah, actually this guy's a jackass, right? Yeah, 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 for sure. And I, I do like the way that they play with the plot line of the blip in all of these sort of movies like yeah. the the like i know i mentioned that before but like like the very subtle comment that the guy says when he says there's like a five-year gap on your resume mm-hmm. you know, or your 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 purchase history your credit rating has yeah. a five-year gap on it to him and his sister when they're trying to get the loan right yeah and they're like hey we were dust at that point could you give us a break <laughs> yeah and and obviously no i mean there's a stigma and, and and you know we're gonna get that kind of stuff coming you know in the, in the next few years when we we all come out of this pandemic because i mean you know for like luckily the three of us have, have been gainfully employed throughout the whole thing but there are people who have lost their jobs and they're going to have like you know uh, a year or 18 month gap on their their resume right so yeah i'm sure there's going to be repercussions from that as well yeah no it's going to be interesting and interesting. it is an interesting yeah. allegory too you know it's the way they're exploring this sort of uh does have echoes of real life in that way sure, yeah yeah um speaking of invincible <laughs> Uh, have you guys I had have, a chance to watch Invincible? I've watched two of the four episodes that are available now. Um, I just actually just watched the uh, the, the second squishing um, today with it with the you know the the soldiers that come from. All right, the, hang uh, on. Realm. Before you get too yeah. far in, I mean, yeah. have you watched it yet? I, I haven't, and it sounds mm-hmm. like they they dropped a few episodes to begin with, and now they're going week to week. Yeah, they yeah. dropped three to start, and then last week was four, and for us in in uh, Spotcast time, episode five is dropping. I think tonight and mm-hmm. uh, yeah so there's there's about halfway through their season as well sort of very quickly because they dropped those three at once and it's not uh, I think one of the things that caught me very right off the hop of it is it's not like a little half hour animated series like you'd expect it's 45 minute episodes like it's almost like a it's almost done like a drama yeah there's sure. a lot in each episode it's not you know you're in you're out you know you can breeze through these things you know watch the whole series in the night like it really is some stuff to chew on it and and it's like the series in the comics is like that too it's not just you know smash bang boom it's it is very much a character piece as well where you really start to invest with the lead character mark his family his friends his you know his growth as a character as a as a superhero it's it's i'm glad they're not just like you know turning it into uh you know villain of the week punch-up show it really is capturing the series really well yeah it does progress really interesting well i mean you know the whole again sort of similar to like i was saying before with the Watchmen, where you got these new sort of superheroes that come out of you know i mean for you it's normal but for me to, to have them not be the the familiar household names kind of thing um you know how how omni man how omni man's portrayed and and mm-hmm. uh, how he's discovering his his talents in the same sense you know we as we were talking about with with uh, superman and lois in fact i don't know if, did that take a break for a while i'm just trying to find it where it was it did but, it's, um, it's taken a hiatus for uh super girl spot for a little while so oh, it'll okay, be okay. four or five episodes and then they're taking a break right and they've got the one son who's sort of got powers but mm-hmm. doesn't quite and and so you know in in you know uh, omni and, and I, the episode today i watched where you know like like he's he's gotten in with this other group of of minor superheroes who are young and his age like one of them is a girl he goes to high school with and and uh at the end of the episode they find out that omni man is his dad <laughs> and they're like what dude omni man's your dad you know like yeah omni man is like the the big as jonathan mentioned last week he's the big sort of he's the superman of this this genre or this mm-hmm. this world yeah there there are certainly there are parallels and i think they were deliberate you know the show was made by robert kirkman who wrote the right. comic co-created the comic and it certainly has you know echoes of familiar things there is a for lack of a better term justice league there is for lack of a better term a superman there are archetypes and i think that's deliberate so that you feel a level of understanding as you come into it right 
right. so right. that you recognize the stakes very quickly of what's happening here. Like, wow, I can't believe that happened to that character. That would be, you know, Green Lantern in the DC universe, or that would be Captain America in the Marvel universe. So very interesting to... Uh, There's lots of red ink in this one, I noticed. <laughs> lots of red ink, yes. <laughs> It is. Um, it, it's a. It's an interesting series. It, it, the thing that I liked about it from the, the first time I read it, and I was a very early adopter because I was covering uh, comics for a newspaper at the time. And Image were very kindly sending me uh, a lot of their books so that I could cover them in the paper and the website. And so I did that and got on Invincible right when it first came out and said the thing I really like about it is it's a modern take on sort of the Spider-Man story of here's yeah. a teenager he comes into the powers there's a whole world around him that sort of already exists how does he find how does he fit in he's still got the problems of a normal teenager with relationships and girls and friendships and all that stuff and that's part of who he is and then this other part of him is this you know huge global giant thing the other thing that they sort of move forward is that it is much more a modern take on that so you know where spider-man would be like oh you know i saved everybody at the last minute well mark's not perfect and bad stuff happens you know they you know i I won't spoil too much because obviously I'd like to have Jaime go into it fresh, but you know, people die, legitimately die in some of the adventures he goes on in the first few episodes. And I think that that really helps set the stakes for, well, this A is not, it's not a kid's cartoon and B, you know, heroes are not perfect and that, you know, he's going to have some major problems, you know, being the hero that he wants to be because when he screws up, hundreds of people, thousands of people will, right. will die. And, and, and yeah, you're right. Like there's a, there's a fair, number of, of bloody incidents in the series and the comics continues like that too mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. the art style really works for it because it's portrayed as a very bright the costumes are bright he wears yellow and he wears uh, or he wears like gold and, and blue and the colors are very vibrant and the animation is vibrant so it's contrasted by these extremely violent moments it's very much the boys in that where you're like whoa like it's incongruous with what you're looking at you're, you think you're watching a, a much more innocent thing and all of a sudden it splatters red across the screen you're like oh okay this is not that and i think that's great yeah. i think that's a real it's a way of keeping the audience on their toes yeah and, and again it's not not something i would specifically go out and seek myself but you know it's it is an interesting story it's not um your typical cop drama or, or hospital drama kind of thing as well right mm -hmm. it's and, not bob burgers either by the way and it's it's wild how talented that cast is it is yeah astonishing how many yeah, good people it. there are like you know mark grayson is stephen young who uh, is not for an Oscar for Best Actor this year. Sandra mm -hmm. Oh uh, is his mom. J.K. Simmons right. is his dad. Yep. Um, you know, other other voices so far, we've had uh, Zachary Kinto plays Robot. Uh, Gillian, oh, Jac that that? Yeah, oh, Gillian right. Jacobs is playing Adam Eve. Um, Jason Manzukas is as Re is Rexplode. We've got um, uh, this, like, <laughs> of course, it's Robert Kirkman. There's a Walking Dead homage thing in here. Lauren Cohen does a voice. Nico Martin Green does a voice. Chad Coleman right. does a voice. Michael Kudlis does a voice. Uh, Ross Marcon does a voice. There's like all these people in there. And then, yeah, Walt Goggins is on as one of the characters. Seth Rogen comes on. He's one of the producers of the show. Um, Zazie Beetz plays Amber, one of the girls he goes to high school with. You know, uh, Clancy Brown's in it. Like it's quite, Mark Hamill has like a bit part on ham has a bit part in it. Like it's amazing how many talented people there are on this show. Like it's just a murderous row of talented acting voice actors here. Michael Dorn. Yeah. yeah and he, he, he's going to be on this week's episode. So I'm, I'm keen to get into that, but yeah, it's, uh, it's really, it's fun to see shows that really capture the spirit. Like, I, you know, obviously I, I come in with a strong comic book background and I like that as a medium on its own. And I'm always a little bit nervous sometimes to, see how they will adapt characters and put them into those situations if they'll change the tone if they'll make tweaks that are inappropriate they've made some tweaks along the way a lot of this is very true to the comic but they, they've made some very good subtle tweaks as they go through to sort of bring things even 20 years forward you know this has probably been about almost 20 years since this came out but it really captures the same spirit of the thing you know like mark is still really identifiable and the situations he finds himself in are something that i think everyone can sort of relate to 
issue. And yeah, I think it's it's going to be really interesting to see if this show has the steam that I hope it does. I, I, I genuinely hope. I mean, this series ran for almost 150 issues. I would be really curious to see how long they can keep this up on as a TV show because it's it's fantastic. And I, and I really hope it, it succeeds in the way that it should. Cool. All right. Well, let's move on to our watch list. Um, yeah, I guess I can go first. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, there's a Star Trek con- or Star Trek connection. I know Jonathan mentioned Resident e- Alien uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I've watched all of the episodes now. And it's very enjoyable. Um, and it's directed by um, Tom Paris, Robert Duncan McNeil. Nice. Yeah. So, and it stars uh, Alan Tudyk, who we just talked about. On, he was, you know, a wash on Firefly. Um, it's a really interesting story. Uh, like, I think it's based on a comic book too, right? Um, where, you know, this, this alien who's sent to, to destroy the Earth crashes his ship and then loses his, loses bits and wanders through this sort of uh, mountain town um, to Colorado, I think, actually, um, and tries to, you know, find pieces of a ship. And, and he's got a power that um, lets him mask himself as a human being. And yet the kids in the town can see him for what he really is. And so there's sort of a, that sort of fun thing. And, and um, I was reading the, the other day that apparently uh, the character was supposed to be very sort of stern and, and, you know, militaristic and, you know, serious. And yet Alan Tudyk got a hold of the role. They decided that it you know, have a sort of a com- comedic spin to it. Right. So really, really enjoyable. The interesting way that they've, they've uh, made this, this thing. My second, uh, watch oh, sure, back thing up. I, Where, where's that airing? Uh, um, I think it's on space in Canada. Okay. Hulu in the States, I think. Can't remember. Yeah, I think it's Hulu. Yeah. Anyway, it's just, it's just finished. This first season just finished. Right. So, and, uh, yeah, anyway, it, they set it up that there, there could be a second season. Um, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> the second thing I watched, and I just finished watching it today, is The Stand. Um, I'm not a huge Stephen King fan, but I started watching this because it's on Amazon Prime and looked interesting from some of the, the stuff I'd seen. Um, it's really good. I mean, I would give it four out of five stars. Uh, it's a really interesting story. Um, it gets resolved in, you know, and uh, set up for a second season. So I think there is definitely a second season coming. Um, it's kind of a bit, you know, it's pandemic-y and, and uh, I joked on Twitter and Facebook today that that uh, it's a ho- it's a really terrifying thing because it, there's a pandemic and they're not, you know, washing their hands or wearing masks or practicing <laughs> social distancing. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, it, it's enjoyable, definitely an enjoyable show. It tends to be a little, I think it's going to tend to be like The Walking Dead, you know, if it goes on for three or four seasons because it doesn't seem to want to resolve itself, right? Mm. So, unfortunate. But, uh, but I mean, uh, and apparently it was written a long time ago because there actually is a movie from starring Gary Sinise as the main character, right? Yeah, um, The Stand came out in like 1980. Was it written as a serial? It was, I think, a, a mini series previously on on TV. No, I mean, I mean, like, wasn't was was this the book that he wrote as a serial, or I don't think so. I think it was one he did, huge ass book. Yeah, because I do yeah, remember there was one, something he wrote a few years ago that was just done as a serial. I, I thought this was it, but yeah, interesting um, story. Yeah, 1978. Um, I just just double check. 1978 wow. is when the book came out. It's it's quite a quite a long book, and it came out quite a long time ago. So yeah, it's pretty old. Okay, yeah. I mean, it's you know typical. It it has a lot of the tropes that you see in Stephen King stuff, right? But um, mm-hmm. I, I'm not going to spoil it for people. And that's my pick. So I guess we'll move on to um, I me. Mean, I mean, yeah, yeah. Mine is a, uh, it's a link here to the Ars Technica article of a 30 year old Soviet television adaptation of the Lord of the Rings that's on YouTube, and um, it's pretty. On the one hand, it's kind of bonkers if you like sort of click through and and see some of the video. And on the other hand, it feels like the Soviet version of the BBC, which which kind of makes a whole right, lot of yeah. sense. Like especially of that era was in 19, 1991. So have you ever seen the original Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy show? I don't I think I ever that. have. Yeah, it's very it's very sort of you know seventies eighties video, obviously filmed yeah. on video yeah. kind of show with really cheesy effects, but it's a great show. Oh, it's so good, it's so funny. Yeah, sorry, I mean no, I mean it, it, it is definitely like a like a stage play that they just happen to film. It, it's not terribly cinematic, um, but it's, it's it's interesting. Like you definitely see like a production of this working as a uh, um, you know for your 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 local art house theater house sort of thing. And it's got some charm to it for that. Cool. And Jonathan, yeah, the uh, the trailer dropped this 
this week for a new or an upcoming Netflix series called Jupiter's Legacy. Uh, Jupiter's Legacy is a based on a comic book series by Mark Miller. And I know there's people out there who are going, no, no, it's Mark Miller. No, it's not. It's Mark Miller. He said his name is Mark Miller. It's Mark Miller. It's spelled M-I-L-L-A-R, but it's Miller. Anyways. He, That's Miller. No, it's not. Anyways, he penned this book, uh, which is illustrated by the extremely talented Frank Whiteley back in 2013 for Image Comics. Uh, Image, uh, sorry, Miller uh, has sold the rights to a bunch of his things through his Miller World imprint to Netflix. And so there were, this is, uh, you know, this is also the same person who created uh, Kick-Ass and, you know, lots of other famous uh, comic books over the past 20 years. Uh, very prodigious comic book writer, very famous one. He wrote this series and it's about, it's sort of, a, I mean, legacy is the perfect word for it. It's about this family, you know, the the uh, parents of the family uh, back in the day get superpowers and they, you know, strive to make the world a better place. They have a family and the story is more or less about the kids in this family trying to live up to their parents' legacy. And it's a really, really excellent comic book. The trailer just came out this week. The series is premiering in early May on Netflix. And it looks to be a pretty faithful adaptation as well and very, very epic in its scale at, at times too. It uh, it stars Josh Duhamel and uh, it looks like it's going to be a good one. I'm, I'm actually, I wasn't sure what to expect when I heard that they were going to do this initially. But yeah, it looks it looks fantastic. The effects look really good. The, the take on the characters, um, the aesthetic of it look very similar. It's not, they're not shying away from capes and tights and, and you know, that. And I think in the same vein we talked about with, you know, the boys and Invincible and stuff like that, I don't think it's a series that's going to pull its punches. I think it's not, uh, this isn't, you know, hey, let's go watch the Avengers. This is a little more to the dark side of that too. So it'll be interesting to see how this comes together. But uh, but yeah, I'm really keen to see what they, what they do. Uh, I think in typical Netflix fashion, I think they're dropping the entire run on the 7th of May. So uh, everyone can scramble at their own pace to try and, and soak it in there. But it does look like it's going to be a good one. So I, I'm keen to get into it. Cool. All right. Well, I guess that's it for another episode. So, hey, John, some people want to get in touch with you, where would they find you? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram as at JPK News. All right. And let me if people want to get in touch with you. I'm on Twitter as at Dev of the Hair. And Tammy, where can we find you on the internet? Uh, you can check me out at TammyCoron.com. And also on the Hero's Journey podcast. That's right. That's right. That's right. For the, the pragmatic bookshelf on the Hero's Journey podcast. Tim, I've totally forgot about that. You're right. <laughs> Good thing Tim's here. here. Yeah. And, uh, and Bill, can people find you anywhere? No, they can't find I can't even find him. I don't even know where he went. He's gone. Pop, pop food truck up and, you know, just wandered away. He was here. He's gone now. Oh, is he? Okay. I think he fell asleep. Where, <laughs> where's where's where is, uh, where is Pop's uh, food truck show up? Oh, Pop's on 412.com. Pop's on 412. Okay, there you go. My name is Timitra. I am T-I-M-M-I-T-R-A on the Timitra Machine is where you'll find me. So until next time, we'll see you in the future. Bye. 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 You've been listening to the Spotcast podcast. If you want to find out more about the podcast or see the episode show notes, visit the Spotcast website at spotcast.com. You can get in touch with us on the website or follow us on Twitter at Spotcast. If you have feedback or questions, send us a tweet with the hashtag AskSpotcast. If you like the show, please consider recommending us to a friend, writing a review on iTunes, or pledging any amount at patreon.com slash spotcast. You can find details on how to help us on our website, spotcast.com slash sponsor us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the future. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, bye. See you, Tim. Sorry, Tim. Yeah. Or sorry, sorry, Jonathan. That's okay. Carry on. No, that's yeah, I got, I got, I got to hang up. Yeah, go, the kid, go, The kids go. are going to bed. The, I don't go. know where the husband went. Everybody go. left me. It's dark in here. It was, it was great <laughs> to have you on, Tammy. Yeah, thank you guys for the invite. And and sorry I, like, threw my husband on you, but he, he looks okay. so lonely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right, right, guys. I'll talk to you later. Talk, talk to you later. Bye. All right, bye.
Yeah, I did see that Jupiter's Legacy just flipped by uh, on the, the Netflix thing, or a pre- I think a preview for it. Yeah, they've got a trailer up on their site, and of course it's all over the net, but uh, yeah, it looks cool. Mm. It looks really cool. Mm. It's, uh, it's funny, though, because I think this has the potential to be a really interesting series, but man, you're going head-to-head with some of these, you know, I think they deliberately timed it to sort of come out towards the end of uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier when people will be like, oh, now what do I watch? Right. So they're trying to fit into that window between uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier and Loki. Right. But it, just, it does kind of to me, it sort of says what a steamroller uh, Disney Plus has become, right? Like, you're going to start seeing the, the same kind of behavior that we've seen in movie theaters for years, which is, oh, you don't want to put your movie out within three weeks of a Marvel film because it's just going to dominate the box office. You're starting to see the same thing happen on Disney Plus too, right? Mm-hmm. Like, stay clear of that. You're, you're nobody's going to watch that on a Friday night. Come out on a Tuesday. Yeah, yeah definitely. Again, I don't know why they keep releasing stuff on a Friday. Well, I mean, <laughs> what does it matter nowadays, right? Like a Tuesday is a Friday, a Friday is a Sunday. What what are the days of the week I matter watch anymore? like three shows on a Friday? That's what it means. Yeah, <laughs> you know. yeah. I don't know if things have loosened up there in Seattle at all, Jaime, but uh, we're back into a full stay-at-home order here in in mm-hmm. Ontario, and you know, there, there's nowhere to go and nothing to do unless you need groceries or or to go to the pharmacy. There's nowhere else to go, and you can't do anything. So you can stay home and watch Netflix or Disney Plus mm-hmm. or read a book, and that's about it. Yeah. I think I saw imagery from like the Ontario subreddit of like Walmart or something with stuff all plastic wrapped up and they'd have these like yeah. one way sort of things of like you come in for essentials and that's all you get sort of stuff. Yeah, and they're closing you can't buy a pot or a pan to cook your food in and Yeah. Yeah, they it's funny cuz they they did a stay at home order before where they sort of said, you know, yeah, all that's available is, you know, you can you can go to big box stores or grocery stores. But the big box stores still had everything so you could go to a Costco or you could go to a Walmart walmart and get you could buy anything you could normally buy there this is the first time where they've been like no it's not fair to small retailers to have you guys open and the small retailers close so they're making them do that and i think it's both good but it's it's just very wildly inconvenient if you like i saw some of the things you're not allowed to buy and it's like you cannot buy a greeting card like you could not buy somebody wrapping paper and a greeting card to give them a birthday present like that's pretty hardcore so uh, not that i disagree with the the need for this obviously the the variants that are here in Ontario are, are deadly and they're spreading fast and I understand why they're doing it but um, but yeah it's it's they're not messing around this time after well, a, I mean, lot, we're after the, a we're lot of the, messing around before that well it, we're at the highest you know infection rate that we've been at ever right yeah. like like it's crazy numbers right and, yeah, and our um, vaccines aren't going nearly as quickly as uh, as they are in some parts of the world particularly in some states so we're kind of struggling on that front and I think until we get those two things up I think this is what you got to do but it's still it's uh it's not a very enjoyable existence unless you really like your house. Yeah. How are things in, in Seattle? How are you guys doing there? Honey? Oh, we're we're doing okay-ish. Although the local news in the the evening news is wondering if uh, so. We're on phase three. So each phase number that's higher means more stuff opens up. I think we're at fifty percent capacity for restaurants. And the Seattle Mariners started their season what about a week ago, and they've had twenty, maybe twenty five percent at most capacity. For for uh, mm-hmm. for pods, right? So you can have like six people in a pod uh, group, and then they separate them all out, so they're yeah. kind of all over, sort of thing for the games. But um, it's entirely possible that um, several counties might slide backwards into phase two, depending on the numbers that come. I guess it's Mondays that these numbers come out for the infection rates and everything. So everybody's sort of watching that right now. Um, the other thing is that on the fifteenth of this month, about a week from today, roughly, the vaccination appointments will open for everybody. Six 16 years of age or older. So we're, nice. we're beating the revised Biden one. By, it was originally two weeks because I think May 1st is what he originally said he wanted all the states to do. And then now it's the 19th of April. So we're we're, we're still trending okay, but I mean, it's uh, it's still a, a very long ways to go, even though there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Hmm. Yeah, it's uh, I know, Tim, you got your first shot. One thing the government here did this week was announced that certain spots that are identified as hot spots, they're going to open up more vaccination and we checked today and our area is actually in one of those hot spots. So I'm hoping that they'll open up more vaccines uh, in this region in the next week or two because I feel a little bit better if I could at least get one of those shots. My my wife, because she works in the hospitals, had her shots, both of them, for, for quite a while and I, I never thought I'd be envious about someone having to have a needle stuck in their arm, but boy, I am. Yeah, we've had, we each had a shot, but it's funny, weird they're doing it by age here, which 
they're I don't think they're doing it that way in the states because I'm hearing more people in the states have had their shots than here, right? Yeah, they're they're definitely further ahead in the curve, and I think it definitely helps to be able to manufacture your own uh, vaccines and keep them in your own country. That's true. We are true. relying a lot on imports, and I think that's that's impaired us a little bit. We're also just really nice too, so we're like, no, no, you go ahead, eh? It's fine. You you take your. We'll just we'll wait. We're fine, okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a tough situation because there's uh, like interesting, not unreasonable, but a little bit too strong criticism of like, hey, you know, the the world is is behind. We need the U.S. to help, and it's like, well, you you know, we have a lot of people to go through, right? Like, it would be really hard to say, okay, let's take our three hundred some you know million doses uh, or people's worth of doses and say, all right, let's distribute that through the world. Cool. There are seven billion people in the world. That doesn't really necessarily yeah. help it go faster, right? It might it might hypothetically seem more equitable. I think the the better answer is for us to figure out how we can get manufacturing capacity out there faster. Yeah. Just, like it just yeah. can't be a handful of countries doing it. It's got to be everybody doing this sort of stuff. Yeah. Well, hopefully everything quicker than quicker than longer would be great. Yeah. It's particularly it's just one it's one of those things that just is really funny too because you just look at it and you know I think everyone was sort of like okay, you know, maybe by this summer we'll actually be able to get out again. And I think that's starting to look more realistic in, in especially in parts of uh, you know, obviously western wealthier countries and for a lot of other places it's you know, so a long way off. I I think there was a notion that you know they might reopen our work offices by the summertime this you know year and now, you know, I, I don't know, it's going to be interesting to see how those things happen and the decisions they make because you know, it is is, is going kind of slowly. Yeah. Yep. It, I don't know if this is happening to you all there in, in Canada, but the uh, the evening news was was all about um, vaccine passports last night. Yep. And it was like, yep. well, you know, these these digital apps and stuff. What about equitable access? I'm like, guys, guys, guys. This Apple and Google solved this problem back in like 2012. Here's the thing: all you do is you print out for everybody a physical paper card that has your vaccination status, and it has a little QR code, and then you also yep. have a pass that can go right into you know google wallet and and apple's wallet that if you elect to you can add it there and have the digital version your phone dies whatever it's incumbent you know incumbent upon you to take the paper version and why does it have the qr code so it links back to the database that says oh you know how do we know if people aren't faking these like you shouldn't be able to fake it because you should only be printing these out (laughs) as necessary tied to that person like this is not a difficult technical problem and there is no equitable problem here you literally have everything you need for movie tickets <laughs> right where i've had uh oh no my my pass didn't work properly whatever i'll just get a new one from the machine and it prints it out right for me it's the right. same concept yeah 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 I've, i saw a new york times piece today about you know the the booming business in forgery uh really pe- oh, people yeah. who are already starting to figure out what the what the requirements will be and where and are already starting to boot, uh, bootleg vaccine passports nice. which is exactly what you want people to do you know it's not like it's a fake id this is something where like yeah, I totally could be a, a super spreader, but it's fine. Like it's a really scary prospect to have people who are like, yeah, I have no interest in getting the vaccine, but I'm going to tell people I did. That's that's well, it's like the people who who were um, charged with spreading AIDS back in the day. Like you know, they they had it, and they still continued to have sex with people, right? Mm-hmm. And then they later on they got charged if they didn't die of it themselves. But yeah, yeah, I mean, that, I mean that's a, that's the thing is like there's too much people who think who think this is a fake, you know. This is invented by the government to keep us all at home or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. uh, that kind of nonsense going around. And there's, you know, there's you know, like there's anti-vaxxers and there's, you know, anti, you know, there's going to be anti-pandemic people as well. Right. So yeah. this is why we can't have any nice things. Yeah. You know, it's a cheery topic. Yeah. Well, and again, I think yeah. it's everyone's going through the same experiences. It's different, you know, orders of magnitude. Right? Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. I, I find myself at that point of like, man, I, I really want to go to other places, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, especially as summer is looming too. I think I think all of us had it in our minds like, well, it was a rough year, but you know, this year at least we'll be able to get back out there. And it's like, oh, the prospect of another, you know, the warmer weather and everything else. You're like, I just I just want to go away from the thing I see every day for the last like 500 days. Well, the good news is that Roger Waters has finally rescheduled the show at the Rogers Center for July 2022. So they did the same thing with the uh, the Rage Against the Machine and Run the oh, Jewels. Yeah concert they announced today it was originally scheduled for last summer at the center which is now not even that it's in scotia bank arena yeah, and yeah. um 
And then it's moved to this summer and to this July. And now it's moved to next July. I was joking with my wife earlier that uh, if Xavier and I go to that show, he'll be old enough to drink by the time we go. <laughs> I was like, great. So not only am I taking him now, but now I'm on the hook for the beers. Damn. Nice. How do you get him to buy the beer? Well, yeah, that's true. Hopefully he'll be gainfully employed by them. Yeah. Yes. And I know you're listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know if this isn't going to get cut. It's time you learned about yeah. $10 venue beers. <laughs> <laughs> and the, and the I challenge. want to teach you an important lesson, son. Sometimes buying the ticket is not the best deal. Right. But well, look, my event is back in the, in my Ticketmaster app. Yeah. Yay. I forget what shows I had bought tickets for now. Yeah, I, I refunded almost almost all. A bunch of them got canceled, and then there were still a few that were sort of lingering out there, and I canceled most of them. I kept my tickets oh, for James Taylor. I have a couple James things Taylor. were... I don't think I don't think I want to give up the tickets for that yet. Yeah, I have the I have tickets for James Taylor too. That's what it was, and and um, Roger Waters. Yeah, I don't know where those are at this point, but I mean the Roger Water ones are back. Ooh, nice. Yeah, if we all survive and he survives. Yeah, and that's <laughs> again. I don't think I'd want to have tickets to go see uh, you know somebody in their older mm-hmm. years. You know, you just keep your fingers crossed that everything's going to work out. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll just keep keep myself amused by sending you guys Star Trek memes on uh, Slack. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like fun. All right. Talk to you later. All right. Take care, Talk guys. See you later. Okay, bye. Bye. I'm going to find the exit. Computer, Arch. <laughs>